hopefully you guys have already done this exam so we can kind of go over this thing together. But I'm going to approach this exam like this is, quote, the first time that I'm doing it. You've, take, you've, you've done Calc 1 exams. This is the same way. It's in three sections. First section is multiple choice, no calculator. When you first come in, we're going to give you an op-scan sheet, and we'll give you this, ver this part one version. You will sit at your desk with the test by booklet down. You will fill out last name first, first name last. You will bubble in your 800 number. Don't forget, you have to bring your ID card to the exam. That's a university policy. Don't forget to bring your ID card with your 800 number on it. You have to bring it, and you'll be using it on this exam. I know on my test you didn't have to do that, but on the final exam, it's ran by the department. It's a common exam. You have to show your ID, and you've got to put your 800 number on all forms. All right? And then right at 8 o'clock, I will allow you to open your test booklet, and you're going to be taking the test. So we flip over and take the test. Now remember also, just before we get started here, Second part is multiple choice with a calculator, but you get no calculator until 9 o'clock. Because at 9 o'clock, everybody has to be done with part number one. Everybody has to turn it in, and then I will pass back part number two and part number three. But until 9 o'clock, no one's allowed to use a calculator. Even if you got part two and part three, you can do most of it without a calculator anyway. But no calculators until uh, I give the official word in the exam. That's because uh, you know, I can't have people using the calculator on part two and three when there's a part one when they're not allowed to have a calculator and it's tough to keep these people organized. University policy, math department policy is nobody's allowed to use the calculator until nine o'clock and even at that nine o'clock number I have to give the official word, okay, now you can pull out your calculators, okay? Same thing as what we did in Calc 1. All right, so now let's take a look at this exam. You know on this no calculator section they're going to hit you hard on integration. Area under the curve. Learn anything about Calc 2? Antiderivatives, area under the curve. U substitution number one, and integration by parts, partial fractions are secondary. Your number one technique is basic rule memorization and U substitution. So, take a look at this first one. We've got the definite integral between 0 and 1 of 4x minus 2 equals what? Well, let's integrate it. Integral of 4x is 4x squared over 2 minus integral of 2 is 2x. I got bound, so it's evaluated from 0 to 1. Clean it up. 4 divided by 2 is 2x squared minus 2x, evaluated from 0 to 1. Fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom. So I'm plugging in 1. So it'll be 2 times 1 squared minus 2 times 1 minus plug in bottom. Plug in 0 is nice at 0. So this is 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. Minus 2 times 1 is 2 minus... 0, 2 minus 2 is 0. So the answer is a 0. And you go, wow, this isn't too bad. I'm able to do this test. But don't worry. The first couple of problems are going to kind of give you a little freebies here just to kind of bolster your confidence. This is a strategy that my education uh, major friends have, have learned through the years that to special math test to bolster people's confidence to kind of give you the first ones couple of gibbies. Don't worry, that work problem is you've got to pump some stuff out of a tank. That's coming. Don't worry. It's down the road here. All right, number two. Remember, integral is area in a curve. So this one says this. The graph of the function g of x is shown to the right, which consists of three lines. Uh, the definite integral from negative 4 to 4 of dx is equal to what? All right, so... This is one of those classic geometric problems. They didn't give me the function, they gave me a picture of it. So when I integrate, I get the area under the curve. And the area captured below the x-axis is considered negative area. So between negative 4 and 4, I'm talking about this. This area in here, area in here, area in here, and this area in here. Now, you can use some geometry on this thing, which is what they want you to do. And you can probably figure it out just by observation. But remember, it's from the x-axis, from the function back to the x-axis. So it's in here, and it's from this function back to the x-axis. Now, here we go. To get this area, I got base times height. I see a rectangle. So the area of this part is got a width of 2, and it has a height of 4. So the area of this part is equal to what? 4 times 2, which is equal to 8. This one is a triangle here. And I'm, I'm doing it this way to show you the geometry because I have no idea what kind of picture they're going to give you tomorrow. 
But so it's geometry. So the area here is going to be one half base times height. So it's one half, the, the base is one, the height is four. So it's one half, one times four, which is two. And notice I'm, they're positive here. Now over here, this is captured below the x-axis. The, that unit, the, the base is one, the height is negative four, so I'm expecting negative area here. So area equals one half base times height, which equals one half negative one, I'm sorry, um, one, base is one, times negative four, which is equal to negative two. But you will also notice, I would have done this, when I'm looking at it, I know that will cancel with that. And this is going to cancel with most of this with a little bit left over. So I know my answer should be negative. So pretty much the answer is either going to be A or B. I mean, you understand what I'm trying to get at in terms of using geometry on this. But I'm just trying to show you all the parts here. And the area of this part right in here is back to a rectangle, which is length times width. So the length is 4. The width, uh, the, the, the width is 4. The length is uh, negative 4. Uh, it's because it's below the x-axis there. So that's negative 16. So I add it up. So my total area is going to be 8 plus 2 minus 2 minus 16. Well, those cancel. And 8 minus 16 is negative 8. The answer is B. Let's turn off the page there. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I was going after? I could have also done, this is negative 2 to 4, and this is 4 to 4. So all I got is 2 to 4 left over. 2 times 4 is, uh, two, 4 to 2 is 2 units. Four distance, that's eight, and I notice I got more stuff below the x-axis, so the answer was negative eight. I could have just observed this and got this answer as well, but it's nice to do the math to confirm this stuff. Remember, the exam is three hours long. You got an hour for this first part. You probably won't need it. Most folks will finish this first part within 30 minutes or so, 30 to 35 minutes on average. Now, there's always some dude that's going to finish the exam in about 15 minutes. Don't copy his paper. All right, but uh, it usually the average is going to be uh, around 35-ish to 40 minutes, which gives you 20 minutes of working part two and three without a calculator, which you still can do. All right, so let's look at the next one. Use this guy. What's the integral of the cotangent max? Well, if you got the formula memorized out of the back of the book, awesome, circle it. If not, remember, cotangent of x is the same thing as cosine over sine. And if I'm going to integrate this one, I'm going to use u substitution. What are you going to let u equal to? Denominator, sine x. Therefore, du, derivative of sine x is cosine of x dx, which is in the problem. So the substitution turns into, this is division problem, sine of x, which is u on the bottom, and the cosine of x dx is 1 du. The integral of the uh, 1 over u is the natural log absolute value of u plus c, back substitution, natural log absolute value of the sine of x plus c, which is answer a. Again, pretty much in my mind a 10 second problem. I'm going long winded because I'm trying not to skip any steps with you guys. Okay? Number four, the definite integral between zero and one of x squared divided by x cubed plus one squared. Remember, no calculators on this thing, so you know the integrals and plugging in the numbers are going to be not too bad for you guys. You're still going to have to plug in some numbers. Basic arithmetic is a requirement for this class. So if you look at this guy here, what method of integration would you use? Your number one technique would be u substitution. I would let u equal to inside my parentheses, which is the x cubed plus one. When I take du, the derivative is 3x squared dx. I observe there's an x squared dx in the problem, so I know I'm on the right track. Move the constant to the other side, so divide both sides by 3. Gives me, oh, excuse me, one third du is equal to x squared dx. Substitution, this becomes the integral, a division problem of u squared on the bottom, and the x, x squared dx turns into one third out front constant du. Now, since it has bounds, I can go ahead and convert my bounds over if I want to. That is up to you. Otherwise, integrate it, and then don't forget to put bounds, and then plug in top minus, back substitution, then plug in your bounds. It's up to you. Does that make sense? Okay? So, this is equal to one-third the integral of u to the negative 2 du. Clean them up first, then integrate them. One-third integral of u to the negative 2 is add 1 over add 1. u to negative 1 over negative 1. Since it got bounds, I won't put a plus C. So when I clean this up, uh, this becomes negative 1 over 
3u. And then I'm going to back substitute negative 1 over 3u times x cubed plus 1, because that's what u is. Now, if this thing did not have bounds, I would put a plus c, put a flag in it, and declare victory. But we got bounds. So what am I going to do? Post my bounds from 0 to 1 and apply my fundamental theorem of calculus. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. Negative 1 over 3 times 1 cubed my, uh, plus 1 minus negative 1 over 3 times 0 cubed plus 1. Again, not skipping any steps, trying to make sure you guys know careful errors. 1 cubed is 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 times 3 is 6, so this is equal to negative 1 sixth. A minus a minus makes it a plus. 0 cubed is uh, 0, plus 1 is 1, times 3 is 3, so that becomes 1 third. Oh no, fractions and no calculator. God help me. All right, negative 1 6 plus 1 third. Easy fractions. Well, if you need me to, I can get your common denominator for you. It'll be 6. All right, so this th 1 third would be 2 over 6, and negative 1 plus 2 uh, is a 1 over your common denominator 6. The answer is 1 6. The answer is C. Does that make sense? Yeah. How long I have class here at 2. No, I have to say this room reserved until uh, 5 o'clock. Oh, yeah. You said this room? Uh -huh. I reserved it in the beginning of the semester. Yes. Uh, because it's really, uh, it's the uh, the uh, no no uh, no, class no class day. You have oh, to actually right. reserve all classrooms. I reserved this one for the Calc one review session at ten o'clock this morning, and at one thirty the Calc two review session until five o'clock. So I, I've got the room reserved oh, with, with the registrar until five o'clock. I, I know one thirteen is probably reserved, and one twenty one is also reserved. So I'm not sure. How many students? One hundred twenty one. One twenty one. I can take two to. Try, try, try. One twenty and I have it here for five years. Salon, so I think it's a one. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Those who are from twelve twenty two, they can go to one twenty one. So if you're in statistics twelve twenty two. This must be real confusing for you. And uh, you may want to follow, follow Jay over here. 121. Go to Fretwell 121. And I'm sorry for confusing you guys. All right, so. All right. Again, the best way to study for a final exams is to go over more of them. The other thing that you should also be doing is every time you're using a different format or formula, write it down because, again, it's all that memorization stuff. Take a look at this next guy. This one is going to use a different kind of technique in integration. The, the definite integral of the integral of 5x to the fourth times the natural log of x dx is equal to what? Now, u substitution is not going to work for this guy. When u substitution doesn't work and it's a product, what method do you always use? Integration by parts. The form of integration by parts is the integral of u dv equals u v minus the integral of v du. The other clue is this. You're integrating a natural log function. Anytime we ever integrated a natural log function, it was always integration by parts. Remember, the derivative of the natural log function is the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. The integral of natural log of x requires integration by parts. Every time we've done it, we've always used integration by parts. So that's kind of a, a, a real kind of a clue that you know what technique you should use on this problem. So, and when I use integration by parts on this integral of x to the fourth natural log of x, you always let u equal to the natural log of x part. Then you've got to do the dv. Well, if u equals the natural log of x, then the dv has to be the rest of it, which is 5x to the fourth with the dx. You have to take derivative of the u, derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x dx. And you have to integrate the dv to get the v back again. The integral of 5x to the fourth is, well, 5 is a constant, leave it alone. Integral of x to the fourth is x to the fifth over 5, but the 5's cancel, giving you just x to the fifth. u, dv, get du, then you get v. Then you plug it into this formula here. u times v, which is x to the fifth, natural log of x, just making it look good minus the integral of v, x to the fifth, times du, which is 1 over x dx. And remember, 
when you are integrating this integral of V du, before you integrate them, clean them up. There is no product rule for integration. The integral of x to the fifth times 1 over x dx is not x to the sixth over six times natural log of x. It doesn't work like that. John's fundamental calculus always pays a part in this stuff. Clean it up first to be able to integrate it. What is x to the fifth times 1 over x? x to the fourth. So I get x to the fifth natural log of x minus the integral of x to the fourth dx. Clean him up first. So this is x to the fifth natural log of x minus what's the integral of x to the fifth? Uh, excuse me, x to the fourth? x to the fifth over 5 plus c. And there's my solution. So it's x to the fifth natural log of x minus 1 fifth x to the fifth plus c. Looks like the answer to me is c. Does that make sense? Look at the next one. What's the integral of 4x sine 2x dx? Well, again, when I integrate sine and cosine, that's going to be standard u substitution. But when I have sine of an angle times another function, what technique of integration do I typically use on this kind of guy? Integration by parts again. Integral of u dv equals, um, integral u dv equals u times v minus the integral of v to u. I always write down my formula before I start using it. So in this problem, remember when I'm integrating polynomial, I mean trig functions times polynomials, the u will always equal to the polynomial part. So the part I quote unquote want to get rid of. So in the integral of 4x sine 2x dx, what would you let u equal to? I would let u equal to the 4x part. That would make the dv equal to the sine of 2x dx. The goal is whatever you let u equal to, you want to get rid of it by taking its derivative. That's why in the last one we let u equal to natural log of x because the derivative of that was 1 over x and the natural log went away. And this one, trig doesn't go away when you integrate it or take derivatives of it, so that's the last thing you want to let the dv be. So, um, let, let u equal to, uh, so you want to let u equal to the 4x because derivative of that would be 4dx and the x went away. But that means you also have to integrate dv. And this is one of those classic rules that you should have memorized. What is the integral of the sine of 2x dx? Well, it's that same rule that I made you guys memorize way back when in chapter uh, test number two. It's the integral of the sine of kx form. Remember, the integral, the derivative of the sine is cosine, therefore the integral of sine is negative cosine. And with the k, the integral of the sine of kx dx is negative 1 over k cosine of kx. In this case, k would be 2, so it's a quick integration. This would be negative 1 over 2 cosine of 2x. Does that make sense? k is equal to 2 in my classic k forms. So, just because this is the final exam and I'm really trying to help you guys out, just remember this. The integral of e to the kx dx is 1 over k e to the kx plus c. The integral of the sine of kx dx is negative 1 over k cosine of kx plus c. And the integral of the cosine of kx dx is 1 over k sine of kx plus c. These were my rules that I have memorized when we ended up, that was the fast u substitution rules. They're very helpful in these integration by part problems. So in this problem, to finish it up, this would be equal to u times v, 4x times negative 1 half cosine of 2x, minus the integral of v, negative 1 half cosine of 2x times du, which du is 4 dx. Before you integrate them, clean them up. Clean up the whole thing here. 4x times negative 1 half would be a negative 2x times a cosine of 2x. A minus a minus makes it a plus. A half of 4 is 2 times integral of the cosine of 2x dx, combining like terms. 
So now all I got to do is integrate this guy here. What is the integral of the cosine of 2x? Well, that's why I wrote him right over there. He's going to be the integral of the cosine of kx is 1 over k sine of kx plus c. So the integral of the cosine of 2x dx is going to be 1 over 2 sine of 2x plus c. But don't forget your other parts. There's a 2 in front of that guy plus that negative 2x cosine of 2x. And cleaning them up, this gives you negative 2x cosine of 2x. A half of 2 is 1 plus the sine of 2x plus c. There's my answer. Now, with this kind of a problem, take your time. Where most students will screw this up, it's so sad that they will get the right answer on the test, but on these multiple choice, they're in a hurry because they think they have to do something or other after the exam. It's three hours. Sit back and enjoy this. So, pay, take your time, look for the answer, and make sure everything matches up. Well, you'll notice that the minus 2x cosine, the minus, they usually stick in the back, it's a positive sine 2x, so it's a positive sine 2x, minus 2x cosine of 2x plus c. The answer to this problem is D. Does that make sense? Questions? Number seven. All right. Remember the fundamental theorem of calculus. First fundamental theorem of calculus was integrate, plug in top minus, plug in bottom, gives you area in the curve. The second part of that fundamental theorem of calculus was when I take the derivative of an integral, I don't go anywhere stuff. All right. That's part of this guy right here. The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we've got this big f of x, which is equal to the integral from 1 to x of the natural log of t dt. They told they want me to find f double prime of 2. So first off, I've got to find f double prime. To find f double prime, I've got to take the derivative for f prime. So to take the derivative of this guy, the derivative of an integral, I don't go anywhere. They cancel. So what's the answer? It'll be the natural log because the integral and derivative cancel, just the function back. But in place of t, you're going to plug in an x. That's part of that first fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivative of an integral cancels, and you just get the function with the bounds. Now, remember, if this is a functional bound, then you have to plug in the function times the the inside from the chain rule game. Okay? But with this one, it's just an x. So when you take the derivative of an integral, you get the function and just plug an x into it. But now you're supposed to take the second derivative. So this is back to calc 1. What's the derivative of natural log of x? 1 over x. But the question they wanted was f double prime of 2. So now all i got to do is plug in 2. The answer here is 1 half. So I'll let you know this was part of that first problem up there. So f double prime was 1 half. So the answer clearly is b. Does that make sense? Question, complaints, comments. Now, I understand that this is the multiple choice part of the test. And, you know, you can cut corners on this one in terms of showing your work. That is true, because we're just interested in the answer that you bubbled in on your OpScan sheet. Which means, number one, make sure that you uh, are happy with your answer before you bubble it in on your OpScan sheet. Don't start erasing on the OpScan sheet, because you know you can screw this up, because it's a computer. And there's no way of getting any points back if, it, if you... Bubble A, oh, I meant B, and go erase it and then bubble in B. And if you don't do a real good job in erasing this thing, it could read a missed Q, and then you actually end up missing that problem. So make sure you circle your answer, and then you're happy with your answer before you bubble it in on your sheet to make less careless errors. Now on this next one, now I'm going to show you the details of the work that you have to do. You don't have to show all these details because it's a multiple choice question. But I'm showing it to you because just in case this problem shows up on the free response part of the final exam where you have to show all your work, I show all my work on this thing. So here we go. Improper integral. Remember, to do an improper integral properly, you've got to turn it into a proper integral. So I don't like what makes it improper is this infinity. So I'm going to rewrite it. Take the limit as A approaches infinity and then replace the infinity with A. The integral from 0 to A of E to the negative 3x dx. Okay? The next thing i got to do is I need to integrate this guy. 
locally, this is an easy integral. Remember, I haven't used a calculator yet. Not go, I'm not allowed to. Well, the integral of e to the negative 3x dx. Well, that's at e to the kx dx, which is 1 over k e to the kx. So the integral of this guy would be negative 1 third e to the negative 3x. Evaluated from 0 to a. Fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom. So I take the limit as a approaches infinity of negative one third e to negative three times a minus negative one third e to negative three times zero. Fundamental theorem of calculus. I plug in top minus plug in bottom on my bounds. Cleaning this guy up, negative three times zero is uh, zero. e to the zero is one. Negative negative makes it a positive one third. And this is negative one third e to negative three times a and I'm taking a limit as A approaches infinity. Again, this is more of a Calc 1 to style question, but it's Calc 2, so you're therefore responsible. Plug in infinity. When I plug in infinity, I get negative 3 times infinity, which is negative infinity. And just a note, what is E to the negative infinity? Zero. Negative exponents go on the bottom. E to the infinity is infinity, but with the negative, it put it on the bottom. And when the infinity is on the bottom, a number 1 over infinity is 0. Ne e to the negative infinity is equal to 0. So when I plug in infinity here, I get 0. 0 plus 1 third is equal to 1 third. And traditionally, we would write the improper answer as converges to 1 third. The converges part lets me know this was an improper interval. But the answer is nevertheless, it's still one third, so the answer was B. Now, what I'm telling you is this, and again, trying to give you strategies on the final exam. You didn't have to show all this detail because it's multiple choice. You could have just integrated plug in infinity minus plug in zero and got the same thing and not have to worry about this limit stuff. But if I was showing my work like a free response question, this is what I expect to see. Yeah. Well, that's true, but equals infinity. Well, if this, I mean, I could give you an improper integral that blows up on you, and so the answer could go to infinity because you get more and more area. So that would be a legitimate answer. You really had to actually work this one out completely out to figure out what was going on. Well, all, every time I've given you guys those uh, integral table formula sheets, I, and on my test and even my homework sets and stuff, I've always tried to give them because this is the way they're going to give them to you guys on the final exam. You know, we're not going to give you the ta integral of tables on the final exam. We're going to give you a question where, hey, integrate this thing, and here's the formula you should use because if you do it right, this one will work. All right, so here's a classic one of those. Fine, you, the following integral from a table appears, uh, form in, appears in the integral table in your text. Here it is right here. Use this to integrate this guy here. And what's amazing to me is they gave you this. That is rare. I guess because so many people have screwed this problem up before, they knew you guys were going to screw this one up. They're trying to help you out. How do I use this formula, excuse me, this formula to integrate this guy here? You have got to do what to this problem? You've got to complete the square. This is a u squared plus a squared. You're trying to integrate a square, a square root of a x squared plus 2x plus 2. So you've got to use uh, completing the square. So, and that's what they're telling you here. You need to complete the square on this thing. Now, I'm trying to prepare you for the final exam because I'm telling you, that's a rare thing. They usually don't give you that. So you should know how to complete the square. So let's go over here and complete the square. I've got x squared plus 2x plus 2. I want to complete the square. I'm going to take the x squared plus the 2x part and push off that plus 2. To complete the square, you want to make sure the coefficient in front of the x squared is a 1, which in our case it is. If it's not, factor it out of your x's. To complete the square, remember, you take 1 half the b term and you square it. You take 1 half of 2 and square it. 1 half of 2 is 1 and squared is still 1. So there's my magic number. It's going to be 1. I'm going to add 1 and but whatever I give it, I have to take it away to maintain equality. So if I give you one, I have to take away one. Now, completing the square, this guy will factor perfectly. How does x squared plus 2x plus 1 factor? It factors into x plus 1 squared. 
and x plus 1 times x plus 1, or x plus 1 squared. And the constant is 2, plus, 2 minus 1, which is plus 1. But they gave that to you. But I thought it's better for us to practice the completing the square, because you're guaranteed to see one of these kind of questions on the test. Now, so this problem actually equals the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of x plus 1 squared plus 1. Now, if you learn anything about table integration, table integration is set up for you guys to use u substitution. They are telling you what u should be equal to. In the form of 1 over the square root of u squared plus a squared, u squared is going to be that x plus 1 squared, and the a squared is going to have to be equal to 1. It's a comparison issue. You always, with this, with this form, you first start out with the u squared, then you figure out what u is. You take the square root. But the square root of x plus 1 squared is x plus 1. And you also figure out what a is by taking the square root. a is also going to be equal to 1. Square root of 1 is 1. Now you've got to do your du. The root of x plus 1 is just 1 dx. Substitute. This turns into the integral of the square root of. This is u squared plus 1 was a squared. The dx got replaced with du. So this was a straight problem of substitution. I didn't have to manipulate a constant. Does that make sense? But, so I'm going to do this one. I'm going to go ahead and change my bounds. Changing bounds, which is good practice on this one. Changing bounds. Remember, we've got this was x. So x is going from 0 to 1. So when x is equal to 1, u is equal to x plus 1. That makes u equal to what? What is 1 plus 1? 2. And when x equals 0, and u is equal to x plus 1 from this statement here, then 0 plus 1, u is equal to 1. So my now my bounds have become from 1 to 2. I changed my bounds of integration to convert them into the u world so I don't have to do this back substitution. Reason why? Well, this is a table. This is my formula. That's equal to the natural log of u plus the square root of u squared plus a squared. No plus c's because I got bounds and I'm going to go ahead and use my u bounds. This is now going from u equals 1 to u equals 2. According to the fundamental theorem of calculus, I plug in top minus plug in bottom. So this is equal to the natural log of u which is 2 plus the square root of u squared, 2 squared which is 4, plus a squared. A was equal to, squared was equal to what? 1. I'll clean my plug in top minus plug in bottom. This is the natural log of u, which is now 1, plus the square root of u, one, u squared, 1 squared, which is 1, plus a squared, which is 1. And now I just clean it up. So this is the natural log of 2 plus the square root of 5, minus the natural log of 1 plus the square root of 2. So there, and I had to put in a little angle there is my answer. Which is going to be answer which one? D. Yeah. No, if I don't change the bounds, then you're going to have to back substitute and make u equal to x plus 1, and then plug in top, which would have been 1, minus plug in bottom, which would have been 0, and then clean that up, you would have got the exact same answer. It just would have taken a little extra space. And, you know, this, by changing bounds, saves a little bit of space. But absolutely, this is math. There's only one answer. You would have gotten the exact same answer, just one extra step along the way. Okay? Questions? All right, next one. All right, and again, another reason why you're going over these old final exams is every time we do a problem that requires a special formula, write it down and put it on a note card and stick it in your ear. Memorization is the key to calculus two. This one, the uh, length of the curve of x squared from the point zero to the point two four is what? The length of curve is also known as what? Arc length. There were three formulas of arc length you were supposed to have memorized. If the first one was the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus the derivative of your function squared dx. The other one is the integral from c to d 
of the square root of 1 plus the derivative of the y function, if it was a y function, squared dy. <coughs> and the third one was the integral from a to b of the square root of the derivative with respect to x, derivative of x with respect to t quantity squared, plus derivative of y with respect to t quantity squared dt. Functions in terms of x, when the function was in terms of y, and when the function was given you as a parametric equation. x equals some function in terms of t, y is equal to some function in terms of t. There are three forms for arc length. Again, I'm trying to review, so I'm giving you all the forms to make sure you've got them all memorized. <coughs> now on this one, I got y equals x squared. My function is in terms of x. So which one of these guys am I going to use? Uh, the first one, this guy here. But I need f prime or y prime, the derivative. What's the derivative of x squared? 2x. So there's my derivative. So I'm going to plug it in here. This would have been the integral of the square root of 1 plus the derivative, which is 2x quantity squared dx. But this is dx, so I need x numbers. My x numbers are going from 0 to 2. Does that make sense? I'm integrating it from 0 to 2. So based upon this one, I can let you know now, this guy has got to be either A, B, uh, pretty much A or B, all right? Because these are integrating from 0 to 4, but my x numbers, because this is an x function, are from 0 to 2. And the only thing you need to do now is just clean it up. 2x quantity squared is 4x squared. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of 1 plus 4x squared dx. There's my answer for arc length, which is equal to answer clearly is going to be B. Does that make sense? Number 11. An is equal to this sequence. Uh-oh, no, no, chapter 4 stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter, chapter 8, test 4 stuff. Here we go. An equals 2n squared minus 100n plus 1 over 5n squared for n equals 1, 2, 3. Which of the statements is true? And what's the question? Conversion, 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 diverges. How do you tell what a sequence, sequence, mind you, converges to diverges? You just do one thing. What is it? Take the limit as n approaches infinity. So I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of 2n squared minus 100n plus 1 over 5 minus n squared. Now, you've got two options on this one. If you need to show your work, do it. It's a L'Hopital rule problem. You plug in infinity, you get infinity over infinity. L'Hopital's rule, take the of the top over the bottom. So this is equal to the limit. As n approaches infinity, the derivative of the top would be uh, 4n minus 100 over the of the bottom, which is going to be negative 2n. You plug it in, and you get 4 times infinity, which is infinity minus 100, still infinity. Over negative 2 times infinity is negative infinity. It's still L'Hopital rule. So do it again. Limit as n approaches infinity of derivative of 4n is 4, derivative of negative 2n is uh, negative 2, and so therefore, uh, of course, derivative of 100 is 0. So the derivative of 4 divided by negative 2 is negative 2. So the answer is converges to negative 2. Honestly, this is a 10 second question. I took 30 seconds to do it, but it's a 10 second question because honestly, it's, it's multiple choice. You didn't have to show your work. You'll notice that the degree of the top and of the bottom are the same. So when you take the limit as x approaches or n approaches infinity, it's always the ratio of lean coefficients. 2 divided by negative 1 or negative 2. So you could have looked at it until what the answer is. And that's fine, too. Does that make sense? All right. Uh-oh, a couple more. And look what they did to you guys. Oh, man. 25% of your exams are going to come from this mess. Make sure you know it. Oh, a series. The sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n squared. I'll put a problem like this very similar on your last test. What is it? It is a question of is it absolute convergent Conditional convergent, which means it's convergent but not absolute, or is it divergent, or is it something else? Okay. Well, I'm afraid when it comes to absolute convergence, there's only three things you can be. You're either absolute convergent, you're either a conditional convergent, which is convergent but not absolute, or you are divergent. Anything else they throw on there is a red herring. They're just trying to see how many people are going to chase it down. So these two statements are stupid. Okay. Sorry, but that's, that's not a question of 
This is a, a series here. Now, what does absolute convergent actually mean? You all you rank these guys. A series that is absolute convergent means when I take the absolute value of this series, in other words, that alternating part is actually not needed, is called absolute convergent. I'm trying to get rid of the absolute part. So you notice absolute value of the negative 1 to the n plus 1. Neg absolute value of a negative 1 makes it 1. It goes away. So this is the same thing as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Okay? What kind of series is this guy? You should have him memorized. What's his name? P series. P is equal to what? 2. What does that mean it's going to do? Converges. And so when I took the absolute value of it, I got a P-series that converges. So is it absolute convergent? The answer is yes on the absolute convergence. So the answer is A. Now, just to remind you, if it failed being absolute convergent, let's say this was not a square but just an N here, which was what was on my test, by the way. Okay, so it's an N here. So when I took the absolute value of it, I got 1 over N. If this was the problem... What's the sum of 1 over n? That guy's got a name too. It's a P-series, but he's got a special name. What's his name? Harmonic series. What does the harmonic series always do? Diverge, which meant it would not have been absolute convergent. And if it's not absolute convergent, then you test for the second level of convergence, which is conditional convergence, which the condition is I have to have that alternating part into it. So you check for conditional convergence by doing the alternating series test on it. Make sure the terms go down, and if the limit goes to zero, it will be, uh, it passes the alternating series test, and then it would converge by the alternating series test, and we would call that conditional convergent or convergent but not absolute. But this one turned into the P-series, so it's absolute convergent. What about this dude here? All right. Now, if you have been actually studying and writing down every word I've ever told you about this stuff, you can look at this problem and tell what the answer is. All right? But I'm going to show you the work on it. Now, what did I tell you guys about these factorials? This is the sum, the series. Sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. Well, anytime I'm going to either powers of n and or factorials, I'm going to use a ratio test to figure out if it's convergent or divergent. But I even told you more than that. Factorials are very powerful. And when that factorial is in the denominator, it always does what? All right, so what's the answer? You definitely, because it's a factorial, you're going to use a, a ratio test on it. And because the factorial is in the bottom, it is the ratio test. However, that is a, a you guys will go, uh, we didn't do any work here. Yeah, you're right, I'm using my brain. But I'm actually going to do the work just because this is the review. Let's practice the ratio test for a second. The sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. The an part is 1 over n factorial. The ratio test says this, I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n. This would be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1. I replace all the n's with n plus 1's. So that would be 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Divided by the a n term, which is the actual sequence part of your series, 1 over n factorial. Then you clean them up. This is the limit as n approaches infinity, absolute value. This is a fraction. It is 1 over n plus 1 factorial. But when you divide by a fraction, you flip and multiply, multiply by the reciprocal. So the n factorial will show up in the numerator, and the 1 shows up in the denominator. Okay? So this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity. Absolute value only kills all negative stuff. We don't have any. So this is pretty much n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. Again, just to practice with you guys, what is the definition of n factorial? n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, yada, 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 all the way down to 1. What is the definition of n plus 1 factorial? That's n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. This is why you always use the ratio test on factorials because these guys are going to knock themselves out out of that, out of that an plus 1 divided by an stuff. What cancels? 
n's, n minus 1's, n minus 2's, the dots cancel, the 1 cancels. Everybody cancels except for one thing. You're left with the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over this term here, n plus 1. And when I take the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n plus 1, this is 1 over infinity, which is 0. So I get 0. That is my quote unquote L value on the ratio test. And just to practice, ratio test, what does it say? If the L value is less than 1, it does what? Converges. If the L value is greater than 1, it diverges. If the L value equals to 1, you nuke something you shouldn't have nuked, try another test. It was probably a very simple problem that you should just look at and do another test on. Okay, it didn't have factorials or powers of n on it, basically. It was a simple problem. So since it's less than 1, we know it is absolutely convergent there. So we say it converges by the ratio test, which goes back to my factorial on the bottom theory that we talked about before. Now, if you look at your clock, I got started a little late on this thing after talking to you guys about some stuff. But I've only taken about, honestly, 45 minutes, or actually a little bit less than that, just to do part number one. And there's a question, ma'am. Yes? When you have a series, when you have that factorial in the denominator, the series is going to converge. When the factorial is in the numerator, it's going to diverge. If you've got factorials in the numerator and denominator, yeah, you better use that ratio test because this is knock itself out and I don't know which way it's going to go. Okay, but when the factorial is in the bottom, always converges. That's been a pattern on these problems and that's what we should have learned out of all the tens of thousands of problems we did on this stuff. All right, so now I've gone to part number two. Okay, but I still got about 15 more minutes before I'm even allowed to use the calculator. This is going to be heavy calculator on this stuff, so I do expect to actually use my calculator to plug in some crappy numbers. But watch, there's going to be a lot of problems on this thing that I don't even need a calculator for. Let's take a look. All right, you know Riemann sums are going to show back up one place. And also, don't forget, since this is a calculator section, look for your know, Riemann sums, midpoint, Left end point, right end point, trapezoid, Simpson's rule. Don't forget to check your calculator. Make sure that program's on that calculator to make sure that uh, just in case it's on a calculator section that you can get an A on that particular question. All right. So, quote, a table of values of a function f is shown. Find the Riemann sum for f on the interval between 0 and 8 using four subintervals. Four subintervals of equal width and taking the sum points at right end points. What is my formula for Riemann sum? To get a right Riemann sum is the sum of f of x times delta x. f of x i times delta x. The delta x formula is b minus a divided by n. My interval a is equal to 0, b is equal to 8. So this would be 8 minus 0 divided by the number of subintervals is n, so n would be equal to 4. So 8 divided by 4 is 2. So my delta x is equal to 2. So I'm starting at 0, and my delta x is 2. So I'm going to go from 0, I get to move 2 units over, which is 2. I get to use another 2 units over, which is 4. Another 2 units over, which is 6 another two units over, which is eight. If you like to, you could draw this thing out on your number line. Zero, two, four, six, eight. These are my endpoints that I'm plotting some kind of interesting function up here with. But what kind of endpoints are we using? So these are my subintervals between here and here, to here, to here, to here. So each interval, I get to use the right endpoint. So I'm gonna use the point on the right. So this first interval, the point on the right is two. The second interval, the point on the right is 4. The third interval, the point on the right is 6. The last interval, the fourth interval, the point on the right is 8. So the formula for the right Riemann sum will be f of 2 plus f of 4 plus f of 6 plus f of 8 all times that delta x. Riemann sums. I sum up my functions times that delta x that I factored out. 
Now, according to the chart, because they didn't give me a function here, what is f of 2 equal to? 1. What's f of 4 equal to? 2. What's f of 6 equal to? 1. What's f of 8 equal to? 2. What is delta x equal to? Times 2. Delta x was equal to 2. All right. Calculator's way over here. Can't quite reach it. Let's see if I can do it on a calculator. I don't think you need any help on this one. What's 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2? 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 1 is like 4, plus 2 is 6. This is like 6 times 2, which is equal to 12. The answer is 6. Now, I didn't need a calculator for this problem. This problem could very easily be on part number 1. Okay? Number 2. <clears throat> Interval from 0 to 3 of f of x dx equals 2. Interval from 0 to 3 of g of x dx equals negative 5. Then what is going to be the integral of 3 times f of x minus g of x? Well, applying calculus, this guy, sums and difference. When I integrate sums and differences, I just, just distribute the integral and integrate each part. Constants go out front. So this is the integral, 3 times the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x minus uh, dx minus the integral of g of x dx from 0 to 3. So this is 3 times. Well, the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x is equal to 2, so that's substitution minus the integral from 0 to 3 of g of x is equal to negative 5. So this will be 3 times 2, a minus minus is a plus 5. 3 times 2 is 6, plus 5 is equals 11. I got 11. Does that make sense? Question. To the next one. If the integral from 5 to 0 is 2, and the integral from 5 to 10 of f of x is uh, negative 5, and what is going to be the integral from 0 to 10? All right. So, look, so I'm trying to go from 0 out to 10. 0, sorry, 0 here out to 10. Well, the integral from 5 to 0 of f of x dx is 2. So I'm going to integrate from 0 to 5. My problem is, notice this, my bounds are what? They're backwards. When you integrate, you always want the smaller number on the lower bound and the larger number on the upper bound, on the upper integram. Does that make sense? So how do I flip this or switch this? What would the integral from 0 to 5 be of f of x dx in the proper order? If the integral from 5 to 0 backwards of f of x dx is 2, what would the integral from 0 to 5 of f, x BX, of f of x dx be equal to? Negative 2. Negative 2. You switch the bounds, you switch the signs. That was one of our fundamental theorem calculus properties. When I'm integrating from a to b of f, that's equal to the negative the integral from b to a of f. You switch bounds, it changes the signs. So the integral from 0 to 5, so the area under this curve is actually negative 2. And this is in the right order. The integral from 5 to 10 of f of x dx is equal to negative 5. So from 5 to 10, this area would be negative 5. So what would my total negative area be equal to here? So the integral from 0 to 10 of f of x, putting those two parts together, would be just minus 2 plus negative 5, which is negative 7. So the answer is D equals negative 7. Does that make sense? This is why we study final exams in case, case we're doing something that you have forgotten because it's been a long time ago. <clears throat> now notice I still haven't touched my calculator yet. It's still cold over here. All right, the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 2 over uh, x cubed. Okay? Now... First thing, you most people want to just integrate this thing, plug in top, plug in bottom, get an answer. But always look at the answers to give you guys a clue of what you should do. They got this common, common, and they throw the word improper in there. There are two types of improper integrals. A common integral is just an integral with bounds, no worries. An improper integral is an integral with bounds where I'm integrating over a problem point or I'm integrating to infinity. When I got an infinity on the bound, that's improper. When I integrate over a point that doesn't exist, that's also improper. Look at this function right here. The function f of x is 2 over x cubed. This sucker has a problem. 
Where is the problem located at? At x equals 0. I cannot divide by 0. And notice 0 is right in the middle of my integrand. So what kind of problem is this if I really try to integrate this thing? This thing is improper, which means to make it proper, I'm going to have to break it up. That would be the integral from zero, uh, negative 1 to 0 of 2 over x cubed dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 over x cubed dx. Does that make sense? Now, again, I'm going out of my way to show you the work. And I do, again, I know this is multiple choice and I don't have to do this, but I'm doing this for your benefit in case this problem happens to show up on a free response. This is the work you need to show. I have to break it up over zero, so these are going to have to be one-sided problems. Because I can't plug in zero, so I've got to go to zero from the left, because I'm integrating below zero there. And now it's from zero to one, so I'm integrating it on the right. So now, I'm going to make it proper by taking the limit, pick my favorite letter. I'm shooting for an A in this class. Integral from A, limit as A approaches zero from the minus side, of the integral from negative one to A of two X to negative three dx plus the limit as pick my next letter b goes to zero on the plus side of the integral from b to one of two x to the negative three dx now remember i got two improper integrals here now and when i integrate if i get a number for one i get a number for the other i add them up to get the total number but if just one of these guys blows off to infinity i get an infinity answer infinity or negative infinity which means it's divergent then the whole thing, I don't care what the other guy does, is going to be divergent. Remember our rules. So to be convergent, both parts have to converge to a number. So pick one that you want to integrate. I want to pick this guy here. Integrate. What's the integral of 2x to the negative 3? Well, integrate, add 1 over add 1. So this will be equal to 2x to the add 1 will be negative 2 <coughs> over negative 2. Limit as a approaches 0 from the minus side from negative 1 to a. Okay, this would be equal to the limit as a approaches 0 from the minus side. This cancels and I get negative 1 over x squared evaluated from negative 1 to a. The 2's cancel. Negative, this represents negative 1. x to negative 2 is a negative exponent goes on the bottom. So the negative means negative 1 over x squared. According to the fundamental theorems, plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be the limit as a approaches 0 from the minus side of negative 1 over a squared minus negative 1 over negative 1 squared. So this would be equal to the limit as a approaches 0 from the minus side of negative 1 over a squared plus negative 1 squared is 1, 1 over 1 is 1, a negative negative 1 is a plus 1. Now here's my question for you. Plug in 0 from the minus side. This is a Calc 1 question. This would be 1 over 0 from the minus side squared. From the minus side of 0 means he's negative. But when you square a negative, slightly negative number, when you square a negative number, what are you going to get? Positive. So 1 over 0 from the, plus, from the minus side squared actually would be equal to 1 over 0 from the plus side because a negative squared is positive. 0 squared is still 0, but I've got to figure out what side of 0 I'm on. When you square the negative, he's now positive. And this was a rule. 1 over infinity was 0. What is 1 over 0 from the positive side? That is from calculus 1. 1 over 0 from the plus side is positive infinity. Okay? So, here we go. When I do this one, when I evaluate this, I got infinity. Infinity plus 1 is infinity. I got an infinity answer, which means it is divergent. Ju I only integrated this guy, and I got divergent. I honestly don't care what this guy does. He's also going to diverge, by the way. But no one cares, because just if one guy diverges, one guy blows up, what's going to happen to the whole answer? Divergent. So this is an improper divergent integral. It is a divergent improper uh, definite integral. Definite integral means it's got bounds. We are trying to work your definition skills. Does that make sense? Now, 
Okay, by this time, or very close to this time, I probably have access to my calculator. What would my calculator do to this problem? Let's just say, for example, I'm using a T84, and I didn't pay attention to anything. I just mindlessly integrate stuff on calculator because that's what I learned in this class. Whatever, dude. All right, math number nine. Two divided by x cubed, comma, x, comma. Shame that you didn't recognize this was improper, but okay, whatever. Negative one to one. Check it out on your calculator as well. Just see, it. what would the calculator do for an answer for me? My calculator says I got divide by zero issues, okay? So, number one, there's a clue that I have got a problem with this definite integral. Okay? Yours should give you something of the same. Your T89s may end up giving you an answer. <laughs> the answer is infinity, which would have been awesome, and then you would have got the right answer because you know that's divergent. But if you notice now that it's indefinite, you can actually integrate just one of them. Integrate from negative 1 to the problem point. You should recognize the problem point at 0. Notice what happens when I integrate that, when I actually recognize that I get a, 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 a 0 number there. And it's, it's working hard because it's Riemann summing this thing up because it's a program on a calculator here. It's just, just, just killing the batteries. Keep going. Just, just, just sucking it out. All right, and now I got the tolerance not met, which means the answer blew up on me. That's what it shows up in infinity. If you actually decide, I don't want to actually put zero in there. I want to get a number really close to zero, point zero 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 one or something like that. You actually get a numerical value. And uh, I don't know, maybe I put too many zeros in there for this one, but eventually there's a point where it's going to actually give me a number, but you will recognize that this number is going to be a very large number. And when you see a very large number uh, and these kind of problems, that typically is going to tell you that the answer is going to be divergent, it's blowing up. Gil, I'm still sucking out my battery power here. So, uh, but it's thinking about that area and it's working hard at it. And eventually you'll see a very big number show up in this thing unless the tolerance aren't met, and they're not. Okay, good. So I went too many zeros on this thing, so let's just really move on to the next problem. So if I got a, a number really, really close, this one will give me a number answer. This one isn't too bad. Still sucking up my battery power, but I'm trying to show you a large number on the calculator. Show up, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next problem and come back when it's done. All right. It's still sucking up my batteries. Okay. Luckily, I haven't used much of this calculator on this exam yet. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the page here while it's still working. And I'll just go to the next problem, and eventually I'll show you the answer. Okay. So, all right, let's take a look at this guy here. Well, tolerance, still not bad. That's just so sad. Well, let's keep getting it down to one. But those tolerance not met tells you really it's blowing up to infinity stuff. All right, what about this kind of problem here? What are you trying to integrate? You're trying to integrate a fraction where the denominator did what? And they wrote it like this to help you guys out. What's the denominator doing? Factoring. So, how do I integrate something to factors? What technique of integration am I going to use? Partial fractions. I'm going to take this x plus 1 over x minus, uh, sorry, x plus 2 times x minus 3 and breaking them into a over x plus 2 plus b over x minus 3. Okay? So, the next thing you do with partial fractions is you multiply by your common denominator, which is x plus 2 times x minus 3. Okay? Now, when I do that, I'm going to get x plus 1 is equal to a times x minus 3 plus b times x plus 2. When you multiply by your common denominator, it completely kills this guy. Just this one cancels and leaves you with the a times x minus 3. And here when I multiply, the x minus 3 cancels, which would be b times x plus 2. Now, I taught my students, in case you're coming from one of these other classes in here, 
and I know Desiree did her class the same way. She, we te typically teach the classic annihilator method because that's the technique that's the easiest to use because you use this technique a lot in differential equations. So we're setting you guys up for other classes as well when you get to those Laplace transforms and the like. So here I let x equal, and I'm going to pick two numbers. And typically to save myself a lot of space and time here, I pick the numbers that make zero on my terms. Since it works for all x's, I choose x to be negative 2, and I choose x to be 3. When I plug in x is negative 2, I get this. I get negative 2 plus 1 plugging in, which is negative 1, is equal to a times negative 5 plus b times negative 2 plus 2 is 0, which goes away. Dividing by negative 5, a would be equal to 1 fifth. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to plug in 3. 3 plus 1 is 4 equals 3 minus 3 is 0, that's a times 0, plus b, 3, 3 plus 2 is 5. This cancels, so 4 is equal to 5b, that makes b equal to 4 fifths. So now, I can write this guy as an integral. Make sure you put the right guy above the right one, because if you screw this up, you know this answer is going to be in your blank somewhere. Put it on the right guy. A goes over x plus 2. I got a to be 1 fifth. So this is 1 fifth over x plus 2 plus b, which is 4 fifths, over x minus 3 dx. Now, one of the things that we've tried to teach you all semester long is the ability to integrate in your head. Now, if you really want me to work this out, it's a u substitution problem. But with these kind of problems, I would let u equal to the denominator. In this case, x plus 2. du is equal to dx. So this turns into 1 fifth. 1 over u to u, integral of 1 over u to u. The integral of 1 over u to u is natural log of u. So that'll be uh, 1 fifth natural log absolute value of x plus 2. But you should be able to do that all in your head. Integral with the guys on the bottom, classic problem. This gives you the answer of 1 fifth natural log absolute value of x plus 2. That's the page number there. Plus 4 fifths natural log absolute value of x minus 3 plus c. But now, take your time, because as long as you didn't screw these problems where the coefficients went, you should be able to get this problem. So I got the x plus 2 has to have the positive 1 fifth, and the x uh, 4 fifths, x minus 3, the answer is e. Yeah. No. No, no. Good question. Even if this was a free response question, remember what I just said. We have been, we being all the faculty members have been, that are teaching Calc 2, have been working hard on trying to get you guys to do integration in your head. This is an integrate, this type of integration right here is an integration in your head. You don't have to show your techniques on this one. You don't need a calculator. All you need is your brain. An integral, one over you is uh, natural log, absolute value stuff. That's what you need for this guy. You don't, this kind of problem you don't have to show. If, if the faculty can do it in their heads, we, we will allow you guys to do it in your heads. All right, but if you guys are doing something or other that is pretty awesome and the mathematical answer just pops in your head and that's just awesome and you have no work and just show us an answer and I can't do that in my head but you can, I don't think so, buddy. Okay, minus 15 points on a 10-point problem. Okay, show your work. All right, take a look at the next guy. The area enclosed by the curves, y equals x and y equals uh, uh, 3x minus x squared. Well, now by this time I'm using my calculator. Anytime they want me to do area between two curves type thing, I really want to graph these guys because I want to make sure I get the right region. That's on area and volume and all those like. So if I integrate this guy, looks like I got a nice uh, y equals x. I can do that one. And the y equals 3x minus x squared looks like a problem. So clearly we're talking about this area is my uh, interval uh, that's captured between the two curves. But I've got to find my, uh, my inter points of intersection. This one's pretty obvious. This is x is equal to 0. What is this point of intersection? Well, you could set the two equations equal to each other, or you can do the second calculate intersection button. It's on all calculators here. First curve, second curve, and then I've got to go guess and go point at that point of intersection there, and I get x is 2. Okay. So these are my two points of intersection. And if you wanted me to show my work, if this was a free response kind of question, x would be 3x minus x squared. Subtract x from both sides. I get 0 equals 2x minus x squared. 
I can factor out an x, and that gives me 2 minus x. Set each factor, x equals 0 and 2 minus x equals 0. So I get x equals 0 and x equals 2. So I could have done it by algebra as well, but we would have definitely allowed the calculator on this kind of a problem on, on the multiple choice part. Now, how do I find the area enclosed by curves? This is the integral of, remember, when you're trying to find area, it's top minus bottom dx, okay, or it's right minus left dy. This is a function in terms of x. So the top function is this y equals 3x minus x squared function. So this is 3x minus x squared, top minus bottom, which is x, dx, over my bounds between 0 and 2. Clean it up. Area is equal to the integral of 3x minus x is 2x minus x squared dx from 0 to 2. Area is equal to integral of x, uh, 2x is x squared minus x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 2. Put a middle theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom, 2 squared minus 2 cubed over 3, minus when I plug in 0, I get 0, it goes away. So 2 squared is 4, minus 2 cubed is 8 divided by 3, and I get 1.33333, which is 4 thirds. Okay, so the answer is going to be B, 4 thirds. But, you are on a calculator section of this test. Other things that you can do to ensure a higher grade than careless error can allow is this. We got a function button that integrates on our calculator here. Use him. Math number nine. If they're asking to integrate something or other, I may have to show my work, good practice, but a lot of the times I can also use my calculator to integrate. The integral of 2x minus x squared, comma x, comma low bound is 0, comma upper bound is 2. I got that, math fraction, 4 thirds, and I got the answer that much quicker. And, it's, and, on, and on, as long as it's the calculator section of the test, more than happy to do, to do this to double check your answer. And you actually should. It's showing you've got intelligence that I have a way of checking my answer. Now, I'm showing you all this. Let's say it's free response. Free response part, you set it up, and you go here. They will probably give you some points for setting it up right, but if you don't show your work and it says show your work, which it does, and you give me four-thirds answer, we know you're cheating by using the calculator, and therefore you're not showing your work and you don't get all point totals on that. I mean, it's a five-point problem. They may give you three points for setting it up, but they won't give you the points for actually computing it properly because it said show your work. So I'm showing all my work here, but this is multiple choice, so you don't have to show your work on this part. Here's another form you need to have memorized. The average value formula. What was the formula for the average value? Average value is equal to 1 over b minus a times integral from a to b of f of x dx. So I've got to find the average value of this guy here, which would be 1 over 3 minus 0 times integral from 0 to 3 of 3x squared minus 12x plus 13 dx. This is going to be equal to one-third times integral 3x squared is uh, x cubed minus integral 12x is going to be 6x squared plus 13x evaluated from 0 to 3. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be one-third times 3 cubed minus 6 times 3 squared plus 13 times 3 minus plug in 0, I get 0. So from this point on, it's just nothing but crunching numbers on the calculator. So when I crunch them on my calculator, I get this. I got four. And also, you should use your integration button just to confirm I got C. Questions? Does that make sense? What about this guy here? Again, what's another formula you need to have memorized? Is this one. A particle moves along the x-axis by a force of 6x squared plus 4x minus 2. 
How much work is done in moving the particle from x is negative 1 to x is 2? One of the basic formulas for work is this. Work is equal to force times distance. That's one of them. And the other one, work is equal to the integral of force dx. So they gave me a force function, so uh, this is what I'm going to have to use. This will be the integral, we'll let it be there, of from negative 1 to 2 of 6x squared plus 4x minus 2 dx. This is equal to the integral of 6x squared is 2x cubed plus the integral of 4x is 2x squared minus 2x evaluated from negative 1 to 2. Fundamental theorem of calculus showing my work here is going to be 2 times 2 cubed plus 2 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 minus 2 times negative 1 cubed plus 2 times negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1. And who am I kidding myself? On this kind of a problem, I'm definitely wanting to check my, uh, my integration skills here. So the integral of 6x squared plus 4x minus 2 comma x comma negative 1 comma 2 is 6. And if this was, uh, did they give me any units on this thing? Well, the force was measured in pounds and distance was in feet, that would be foot pounds. If the force was in newtons and the distance was in meters, it would be the classic newton meter known as a joule. But, uh, wait a minute here, I've got a problem here. I... Oh, I did? Oh, thank you for noticing. All right, so plus 4x. How about 18? Does that work a little better? All right. Be careful when you go at 90 miles an hour. You do tend to make careless errors. That's why. How long is this final exam? What do you have to do after that final exam? Nothing. Sit back and enjoy this thing. All right. So I did it all right. I should have just kept crunching my numbers out. There you go. Be careful. Watch the careless errors. Here's another one that was right off of your old test number four here. What is the coefficient of x plus 1 squared in the Taylor expansion of the function x cubed plus x minus 1 about a equals negative 1? Let's remind ourselves of the Taylor series. In the Taylor series, f of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a over 1 factorial times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus f triple prime of a over 3 factorial times x minus a cubed plus yada yada yada. Complete memorization, Taylor polynomial. What is the difference between a Taylor polynomial, a Taylor series, and a Maclaurin series? A Maclaurin series is a Taylor series, but a is equal to zero. Your centering point is zero. All right, so here we go. Okay, I need to have the function, the first derivative, and the second derivative. Well, the function is pretty straightforward here f of x was equal to x cubed plus x minus 1. What would my first derivative be? That would be 3x squared plus 1. What would my second derivative be? That would be 6x. What would my third derivative be? 6. And my fourth derivative, if I was going to go that far, would be 0. So at that point, I don't need any more derivatives. Does that make sense? But now, to plug it into this series, you got to have f of your centering point, which is negative 1. So f of negative 1. Now I'm going to plug it in here because I'm going to run out of room if I don't. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Plus negative 1 minus 1. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1 is negative 3. f prime of negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3 plus 1 is 4. f double prime of negative 1. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. F, uh, F triple prime of negative 1. Well, that's just a constant. So that F triple prime is going to be just 6 xf. And the 6 derivative is 0, so I don't need him. Okay? So now, plug this into your Maclaurin series. So your Taylor polynomial. So I'm going to try to draw it right, right underneath this thing. So your Taylor polynomial is going to be equal to f of a, which is negative 3, plus f double prime, I mean f prime of a, which is 4, over 1 factorial times x minus negative 1. x minus a minus is a plus. 
That was where your x plus 1 comes from. Plus f double prime of a is negative 6 over 2 factorial times x minus negative 1 out of x plus 1 squared. Plus f triple prime of a would be 6 over 3 factorial times x plus 1 cubed. There is my Taylor polynomial for my function. But what is the question, though? The question is this. What is the Taylor expansion coefficient of x plus 1 squared? What is the coefficient of the x plus 1 squared? There's my x plus 1 squared. So my coefficient is going to be equal to the negative 6 over 2 factorial is the coefficient. Does that make sense? That's the number, coefficient meaning the number in front. What's 2 factorial? That's 2 times 1, which is 2. So this is negative 6 divided by 2, which is equal to negative 3. The answer is D, negative 3. Yeah. Repeat the last step. Okay, the question is, I went ahead and went out of my way to go ahead and write out the entire Taylor polynomial for you guys on this one. So here's my Taylor polynomial. But the question is, what is the coefficient of the x plus 1 squared term? So I go and find, there's my x plus 1 squared term. The coefficient is the number that is the, the number in front, which is the negative 6, which is the f double prime at negative 1, divided by 2 factorial. So it's negative 6 over 2 factorial. 2 factorial is uh, 2, so negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. That's the coefficient for that. All right. Oh, we've got another one of these series ones. Oh, yay. All right. Consider the series. The sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of x minus 1 to the n over n squared. What's the question? The question is in the answers. The interval of convergence is what? Anytime you need to find the interval of or interval or radius of convergence of a power series. This is a power series because it has a series with an x in it. What do we always use? Ratio test. So let's use the ratio test. So just to separate my papers here. Here we go. Ratio test. So I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus 1 over a n absolute value. This will be the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus 1. This will be x minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared divided by a n. x minus 1 to the n over n squared. Okay? This would be equal to when I flip and multiply the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of this will be x minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared. Flip it up, the n squared shows up on top, and the x minus 1 to the n shows up on bottom. Ratio test. Now, clean it up. What do I got? I got x minus 1 to the n plus 1's on top, and I got x minus 1 to the n on the bottom. x minus 1 to the n plus 1 is x minus 1, pulling off one of them, times x minus 1 to the n. That cancels with that leaving me with the limit as n approaches infinity of x minus 1, because that's what's left over, over, and I've got this n divided by n plus 1 quantity squared. And I wrote them like that because they had the same power. I went ahead and factored out that power. n squared over n plus 1 quantity squared is the same thing as n divided by n plus 1 quantity squared. The reason why is I'm going after the limit. Now, take the limit as n approaches infinity. Well, there's where the n's are at. It's infinity over infinity. So I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule. What's the, what's the derivative of n is 1. The derivative of n plus 1 is 1. This is going to 1 over 1, which is 1. And then when I square it, I still get 1. So I'm left with the absolute value of x minus 1. When I do my ratio test, the n over n plus 1 quantity squared the limit goes to 1. Limit as n goes to infinity, the term goes to 1. Now, I'm left with the absolute value of x minus 1. When does the ratio test converge? When the ratio term, the L value left over, has to be what? Less than 1. Go back to college algebra and solve. Absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 1. 
This is a double sided inequality. Negative 1 is less than x minus 1, which is less than 1. I'm going to add 1 to both sides. And I got 0 is less than x, which is less than 1 plus 1 is 2. There is almost my interval of convergence. But what else do I have to do? You have to test the endpoints to figure out the true interval of convergence. So based upon this right now, I can blow off E. Pretty much it's got to be between 0 and 2. But now we've got to test those endpoints. Testing the endpoints here is this. Okay. Testing my endpoints. This is going to be x equals 0 is one endpoint, and the other endpoint is x equals 2. Let's plug in x equals 0. This will be the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 0 minus 1, which is negative 1 to the n, over n squared. What kind of series does it turn into when you have, uh, when you plug in x equals 0? Negative 1 to the n over n squared. What kind of series is that? Alternating series. So what test should you use? Alternating series test. So you're going to write out some terms, and your bm part is going to be the 1 over n squared. So n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. 1 over 1 squared is 1. 1 over 2 squared is a fourth. 1 over 3 squared is a ninth. Notice my terms are going down. That's a check. And if I take the limit as n approaches infinity of a 1 over n squared, I get 1 over infinity, which is 0, checks. So with the terms going down and the limits going to 0, what does the alternating series test tell me I'm going to get? It converges. So my question is, do I want my point x equals 0 in my interval of convergence? Yes or no? Yes, you do. So you put equal to right there. Okay? Now, plug in x equals 2. Yeah? No, all we're doing is testing for convergence. We don't care if it's absolute or not. We just want to make sure it converges. If it converges, we want it. If it doesn't converge, we blow him off, and not including him in my interval of convergence. So, x equals 2, plug it in. This is the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 2 minus 1 to the n over n squared. This is the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity. What is 2 minus 1? 1 to the n over n squared. What is that equal to? What is 1 to the n power? 1 to any power is always what? 1 over n squared. What kind of series is this thing just turned into? It's a p series. What's p equal to? What does it do? Converges. So do you want this point of do you want this point in your interval of convergence? Yes, you do. So you want to include the 2 as well. So my interval of convergence is between 0 and 2 with brackets. So the answer is A. Does that make sense? Anytime they ask you what is the interval of convergence, they, you should use the ratio test. But then if you've got bounds on that interval of convergence, test those endpoints. Sometimes they work. Sometimes the endpoints don't work. That's why you have all these other tests. Well, they shouldn't have had to say that word, but they did. Here's a geometric series. Wow, what a surprise. It's a bunch of numbers raised to powers of n. If that's all you've got, that's called a geometric series. You should recognize that. From day one. Now, so I got a geometric series. And how nice of it was they went ahead and wrote it for you like this. Wow, you should be able to do that. The, um, the 5 to the 1 minus n, that's the same thing as uh, negative n plus 1. Factor out the negative, that's n minus 1. So negative exponent puts the 5 on the bottom. And you can pull off one of those two to the ends, make it 2 times 2 to the n minus 1. And you'll end up cleaning it up to this guy here. You should see that. But now that they wrote it like this, this is a geometric series. Notice you start at 1, and the power is n minus 1. We know this converges to a over 1 minus r if the absolute value of r is less than 1. What is my a in this problem? What is my r? a is equal to what? 2. What's r equal to? Two-fifths, you'll notice that the two-fifths is less than one, so it checks, so it converges to the function a over one minus r. 
which is 2 over 1 minus 2 fifths, which is equal to what? This is 2 divided by, what is 1 minus 2 fifths? 3 fifths. And 2 divided by 3 fifths is what? Well, flip and multiply your fraction. When you flip the 5's on top, 2 times 5 is 10 thirds. So it converges to 10 thirds, which is answer C. Does that make sense? About as easy as it can come. Usually they just give you this, this form and you have to play the algebra. So you should practice to make sure that you can play algebra on this one to make sure you can turn it into this, which is the proper form. Number 12. Here's a classic another series type of question that we stole and put it on your last test. Here we go. Which of these series converges? The following series. Which of the following series diverges? Read the question. Diverges. Well, this one, I would do an, a comparison test on this one. The cosine, if I do absolute values here, cosine or sine is always bounded by what number? One. So this thing is less than or equal to one over n squared. And what kind of series is this guy? P series. P equals 2. And so what does it do? Converges. So we're after divergence, so I don't want this guy. B. Anytime I got polynomial over polynomial, you should feel the pressure to do this. Take the limit as n approaches infinity of the n cubed over 100 n cubed plus 7. Because I'm doing it in my head, but I'm writing it out for you guys. You always do this because anytime you got a series, you should be taking a series and the sequence part should always be fractions where the denominator is bigger because these guys have got to go to zero. It's called the divergence test. If the sequence part of a series, if the limit of, as n goes to infinity, if the sequence part of a series does not go to zero, it automatically, if you don't get zero, if you get uh, you know, a number that's not zero, the series is always going to diverge. What do I get here? I don't have to do L'Hopital's rule. You should see the answer. What is it? 1 over 100, which is not zero. And by the divergence test, which states that when I have a series and the limit as n approaches infinity of a n does not equal zero, then the series diverges. So this series diverges. The answer is B. By the divergence test. But I will prove you the rest of the way. You see this guy right here? I would do a comparison test. What would you compare this thing to? 1 over, I'm looking at you guys, I would compare it to 1 over n squared, which is a p-series, which converges, because p equals 2. What would you compare this guy to? Well, actually, this guy is going to be one of your telescoping series, which always converges because you can bust that fraction up because the denominator factor. But you could still compare it to uh, 1 over n squared if you distribute here because that's n squared plus 2n, which is still a convergent p-series. So we seem to be comparing it to the same convergent p-series. And what about this guy here? What test would you use on this guy? I would use the alternating series test on this one. And with this one, your BM part is 1 over 2M plus 1. And number 1, when you write out your terms, 1, 2, 3. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, so this is 1 third. Uh, the next one's going to be 1 fifth. The next one's going to be 1 seventh. You'll notice the terms go down. And number 2, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2M plus 1 is equal to 1 over infinity, which is 0. It converges by the alternating series test. It converges, converges, converges. The only one that diverged, and it was really, you yeah, I've been doing the divergence test to show it. I didn't have to do the rest of these guys once I found my guy, but I can confirm it in my head because, hey, it's a three-hour exam. You've got no place to go. Enjoy. Okay, take your time. So now, I finished up that part. Let's move on to part number three. Part number three, according to my calculations on my watch, I still probably got another good hour to do on this exam. And I've goofed off and talked about lots of stuff already, so I still got tons of time on this exam. Take your time, you'll make it. 
But uh, if you're really, really slow, you mean you have to be aware of time. So each section should take you about an hour. Try to give yourself a little bit more time for the free response section. Okay? Here we go. And remember your program. It is very helpful. All right. Use Simpson's rule to approximate the integral from 1 uh, to 5 of natural log of x dx. Use Simpson's rule with n equals 4. And how nice of them. Don't bake on this. Sometimes they give you the formulas because they're being nice. Sometimes they don't. You need to know the Simpson's rule formula, the trapezoidal rule formula, the midpoint rule formula, and your basic Riemann left, right Riemann sum formulas. You need to know the formula for all of those things. Okay? This is the Simpson's rule formula, which is delta x over 3 times f of a, or your endpoint, plus 4, f of x1, plus 2, f of x2, plus 4, 2, 4, 2, dot, 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 plus f of b. The trapezoidal rule formula was delta x over 2 times f of a plus 2 times f of all the internal points plus f of b. The midpoint rule is just delta x times f of all the midpoints of your intervals. Okay? <clears throat> just to remind you guys. So, I'm going from, so my a equals 1, my b equals 5. What is my delta x going to be equal to? The formula is b minus a over n, which is 5 minus 1, and n is equal to 4 in this problem. What 5 minus 1 is 4 over 4 equals 1. Okay? I am trying to integrate this function. The function is y equals the natural log of x from 1 to 5. And my delta x is equal to 1. So I'm going to go from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, from 3 to 4, and from 4 to 5. 1, 2, 3, 4 subintervals. Okay? So my s4... My formula is going to be delta x over 3 times f of x, your first point, which is a. It's going to be f of 1 plus 4 times f of your next point, which is 2, plus 2 times net of your next point, which is 3, plus 4 times f of 4, plus f of your last point, your end point b, which is 5. Always plus f of 5. Remember, it's a 4, 2, 4 combination. You start with 4. Remember, n has to be even. And you always end on a 4, on a 4, 2, 4 combination with the f of a and f of b at the beginning and end. So, plugging my numbers in, s4 is going to be equal to delta x, which is 1 over 3, times f of x. Remember, my function is the natural log of x. That will be the natural log of 1 plus 4 times the natural log of 2 plus 2 times the natural log of 3, plus 4 times the natural log of 4, plus the natural log of 5. This is equal to <coughs> 1 third times the natural log of 1, which I know is 0, you should too, plus 4 times the natural log of 2, plus 2 times the natural log of 3 plus 4 times the natural log of 4 plus the natural log of 5. And don't forget to close the parentheses at the end. Okay? Hit enter. I got this. 4.04147621. Now, we have worked real hard, and I gave you guys another homework problem, which is in one of my piles up here. Uh, no, actually, that was uh, from the calculator lab number one. Uh, the the uh, Riemann sum problems, all right, was uh, one of your was this one here. So I'm going to use my program just to double check because I don't I don't want to miss any points on this exam. So y equals my function was the natural log of x. Then I'm going to go to Second quit, clear. I'm going to go to program. I'm going to scroll down all my programs and I'm going to go to my Riemann sum program. But I'm trying to do a Simpson's rule, right? So Riemann sum, my A was equal to what? What was my low bound? One. My B was equal to five. But this was Simpson's rule. And I'm trying to use my program. And the Simpson's rule in the program is a double end program, right? 
So if I want an n equals 4, what do I got to type into my calculator to get an n equals 4 for Simpson's rule? I got to type in a 2 because the Simpson's rule program doubles it. So I double check it, and there's my Simpson's rule for 2n, and I got 4.04147, which is exactly what I got down here. So I am very happy with my answer. So I know I'm going to get full credit for this part. Use your program. I mean, because careless error killed on this exam. We'll talk about statistical results in a minute. The error of estimate in Simpson's rule approximated this. And you should remember your error of estimates here. For Simpson's rule, this would have been uh, basically S in here. For Simpson's rule, is it less than or equal to K times B minus A to the fifth over 180 N to the fourth, where K was the upper bound for the fourth derivative? What is the, trape what is the uh, error bound formula for the trapezoidal rule? Do you remember? For the trapezoidal rule, it was K times B minus A cubed over 12 N squared. And what was the trapezoidal rule formula for the midpoint rule that you have memorized? K times B minus A cubed over 24 N squared. You should have these memorized because I cannot guarantee. I can show you old file exams where they asked the exact same question where they didn't give you the formula. You should have the formulas memorized. This is calculus too. Memorize everything. Okay? So, here we go. So on this part, we were in is even number of intervals, subintervals, and k is the upper bound of the fourth derivative. They told you everything here. The question is this. The error of estimate for the numerical integration in part bay of, uh, from above. We want to find the error bound for Simpson's rule with n equals 4. That's what we want. First thing we've got to find is we've got to find the k. My function, remind you, was the natural log of x. k is the maximum value over your interval of the fourth derivative. So knock yourself out. What is the first derivative of natural log of x? 1 over x, which is also x to negative 1. What is the second derivative? Negative 1, x to negative 2. What is the third derivative? 2x to the negative 3. What is the fourth derivative? Negative 6, x to the negative 4. Fourth derivative. Remember, on the trapezoid and midroot formulas, k is the maximum value of the second derivative. But on Simpson's rule, it's the maximum value of the fourth derivative over my intervals. So my fourth derivative here of x, the fourth derivative is equal to negative 6 over x to the fourth. And your bounds are between 1 and 5. So I'm going to graph this thing between 1 and 5 to find my k value. So y equals, clear it out, it is negative 6 divided by x to the 4th. And I only care about between 1 and 5. So I'm going to go like 0 to, uh, I don't know, 6 or something like that just to show you. And I'm going to graph it. And there's my graph. The graph actually comes in here and does this. Remember, plug it in. Plug in 1, I get actually negative 6. When I plug in 5, I get some really crappy small fraction, whatever it happens to be. Okay? Now, this k is the maximum value of the absolute value of the fourth derivative. So, we're talking about the fourth derivative. Where is the farthest distance away from the x-axis? The distance, the maximum value of my fourth derivative. Well, the maximum is actually negative 6 because it's the absolute value of the fourth derivative max. Okay, the maximum of the absolute value. So this would be absolute value of negative 6, which is 6. My k is equal to 6. And the way you look at k is the distance farthest away from the x-axis of that fourth derivative. And it's absolute value because we want this number to be positive. Does that make sense? So, there's my k. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that now? No. No, only the Simpson's rule error bound formula uses the maximum value of the fourth derivative. 
The trapezoidal rule and the midpoint rule uses the maximum value of the second derivative. Okay, so I would have done, I would have graphed the second derivative in both of those and then looked between one and five to figure out if I was doing trapezoidal midpoint rule on that. All right, so this is uh, less than or equal to, and here is where the big point totals we gave on this particular part of the exam, on this part, because so many people screwed it up because they couldn't figure out what K was. It was sad. All right, now, once you got K, which is now 6, plug it in. It'll be 6 times B, which is 5, minus A, which is 1 to the 5th, over 180. What was N in part A? N was 4 raised to the 4th. Remember, you're using the information from part A to estimate this thing. So this is definitely a calculator problem now. So I'm going to type this in. 6 times 5 minus 1 raised to the 5th divided by parentheses 180 times 4 to the 4th close parentheses around your denominator. Watch the careless error. And I got the error for the Simpsons rule with n equals 4 is less than or equal to 0.13333. Hopefully you got the same thing. So that is my answer. Also, for those TI-89 fans, we would have also accepted 2 over 15 because we had some people giving us that answer. Which, oh yeah, same thing, we gave them that. Does that make sense? Questions? Yeah, sorry, yeah. For the first part on top, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Simpson's rule always has to have an even number of intervals. Trapezoid or midpoint rule can use any kind of intervals you want. Um, tra excuse me, trapezoid or midpoint can use any number of intervals you want. But Simpson's rule, by definition, the way it was de derived, which was one third the uh, trapezoidal rule plus two thirds the midpoint rule, gives you a double n value of Simpson's rule. In uh, Simpson's rule, always has to have an even number of intervals. So when you do this four two four two four combination, you always start out on a four on your first internal point. You end up on a four just before your end point. And as long as n is even, that pattern will always work. That's how n has to be even for Simpson's rule. So they could not have asked me the question, use Simpson's rule with n equals 5, because that would be stupid. You cannot do that. n had to be even in this problem. No, no, no. I got four terms. I mean, four partitions. No, I'm, my bounds are going from 1 to 5. Don't be confused by that. But delta x is b minus a over n. 5 minus 1 over 4, which is equal to 1. So I started out at 1 and go from 1 to 2 because my delta x is 1. You start at 1 and add 1. 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5. Count them. I'm starting here. I'm not counting 0. And I'm ending here. There's 1, 2, 3, 4 subintervals. Partition is 4. It is even. n equals 4. Okay. Yes, of the fourth derivative, and make it absolute value. Yes, that is the value of k. And if it was a trapezoid or midpoint rule, it's the maximum value of the second derivative. Right. All right, so let's take a look at this next guy. Consider the region in the first quadrant bounded by the curves y equals x cubed, y equals 1, and the x-axis, and the y-axis. All right, find the area, find the x-coordinate of the centroid, and find the y-coordinate of the centroid. So they're asking you a centroid question. More formulas, make sure you have them memorized. So the first thing you should always do is graph your region. I got y equals x cubed. We know that's a big squiggly line right here. I got y equals 1. y equals 1 is up here. This is y equals x cubed. And I got the y-axis. This is the y-axis. 
Where is the region that we are trying to find the area of? What is bounded by all three of these guys? The y-axis, y equals one line, and y equals x cubed line. It's this region here. So many students screwed this up because they could not identify the region bounded by all three curves. They were using regions over here and up there at infinity. I have no idea where this region we're going from. But this is the region. You have to draw it out and label everything and be bold about it. And then analyze all parts and figure out what region kind of cuts everything in, in for one of these guys. Does that make sense? So, how do I find area? Area is either top minus bottom or right minus left. Well, you need some points of intersection here. I'm going to go top minus bottom here. This is x equals 0. What is this point of intersection here? Well, y equals 1, but it's got to be when y equals 1, it's got to be equal to the x cubed graph here. So x is going to have to, by taking the cube root of both sides, x is also going to have to be 1. So my bounds are going to be from 0 to 1. So I would go from 0 to 1 of the top function, which is 1, minus the bottom function, which is x cubed. Remember, I'm doing top minus bottom dx. You could also do right minus left dy's if you really, really wanted to, because you'll get the same answer. So show your work, show your picture. Now integrate it. Integral. What's the integral of uh, excuse, 0 to 1 of 1 minus x cubed dx? Integrate this thing, integral of 1 is x, integral of x cubed is x to the 4th over 4. Evaluate it from 0 to 1. According to fundamental theorems, you plug in top, minus, plug in bottom. The bottom is 0, and 0 minus 0 to the 4th divided by 4 is still 0. So this is equal to 1 minus a quarter, which is equal to 3 fourths. So the area is equal to 3 fourths. Unit squared, because my guys have been programmed about that. Always pay attention to units. Did I lose you anywhere? Does that make sense? Top minus bottom or right minus left. Un All right, now, here we go. What is the formula for the x coordinate of a centroid? That is x bar. The x coordinate of a centroid. You have to take the moment about the y and divide it by the mass. So, and to figure out, by the way, look at this problem down here. Might as well do both of them at the same time. How do I find the y coordinate? It's the moment about the x divided by the mass. What is the formula for mass? Might as well write down all my formulas because we're reviewing here. Mass is area times density, which we call rho. Okay? And we keep it as a constant rho. When I get you guys into count three, if you get out of count two, you can actually, we'll make uh, rho a multivariable function in terms of x and y's, so you'll see this stuff again. But we can make it a function, but in count two, rho is going to be a constant. All right? What about the moment about the x-axis? The moment about the x-axis is the tendency to rotate around the x-axis, which comes from the disk washer formula. The formula, pi is equivalent to rho over 2 times integral of the top function squared minus the bottom function squared dx from a to b. The moment about the y is the tendency to rotate around the y. I'm using my functions are in terms of x format here. This would be the shell method because the function in terms of x, the moment about the y is the tendency to rotate around that y axis. So I'm going to have rho times integral of point radius, which would be x, which says we're going around the y axis, times top minus bottom dx. And I'm writing this for your benefit because this is what you should have memorized about centroids and center masses. And it comes from the shell, I mean the disc washer and the shell method. All right, so here we go. The first one was easy. What's the mass? The mass is equal to area times rho. What was the area? Well, look, look up there, because this is what part A was all about. Okay? So what's my area? 
3 fourths rho. So now all I got to do to get the x coordinate, remind you, is take the moment about the y, which would be rho times the integral of x times my top function. So I'm using this form right here. The top function of my region. Here's my region. What's on top of this thing? Y equals what? 1 minus the bottom. What defines the bottom part of this region was the x cubed dx over my bounds from 0 to 1. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> this is your uh, free response part of the test. So you show your work. Yes, Beth. So, did you give up no, no. In this one, the question is find the x coordinate. And the formula for the x coordinate is the moment about the y divided by the mass. So I have to use this formula for this one. Okay? So, and then I will show you how I'm going to calculate this x bar in a second once I get this answer. So, but my point to this is, remember, this is where you're shining for the professors. Show your work. This is rho times integral of x minus x to the fourth dx from 0 to 1, which is equal to rho times integral of x is x squared over 2 minus x to the fifth over 5 evaluated from 0 to 1, which is equal to rho times 1 squared over 2 minus 1 to the fifth over 5 minus rho times, you plug in 0, you pretty much get 0. Well, 1 squared is 1 divided by 2 is 1 half, so this is 1 half minus 1 fifth, and 1 half minus 1 fifth is 3 tenths. So this is 3 tenths rho, the moment about the y. But, to answer their question, and I got enough room right over here, x bar, which is equal to the moment of what the y divided by the mass, would be 3 tenths rho divided by 3 fourths rho. What happens to my rows? They're going to cancel, and that leaves me with x bar being equal to 3 tenths divided by 3 fourths. Well, when I flip this up, that would be 4 thirds. The 3's will end up canceling. That's 4 over 10. So we would have accepted the answer 4 tenths or 2 fifths. Or for those people that just love decimals, we're real happy to give them the old 0.4 answer too. No units. Huh? No units. No units on center of mass. Because it's a coordinate. Okay? So, now take a look at the next guy. All right. So now this one, I want to find the y coordinate of the center of, of the center of the region here. So that is the moment about the x divided by the mass. Well, we still got the mass up here, which was area times rho, which is three fourths rho. Now to get to the moment about the x-axis, that would be rho over 2 times integral of my top function, which is still 1, but you've got to square it, minus the bottom function, which is x cubed squared dx from 0 to 1. Okay? Clean him up. This is rho divided by 2 times integral of 1 squared, which is 1, minus x cubed squared. Power to a power multiply, that's x to the 6 dx from 0 to 1. This is rho divided by 2 of the integral of 1 is x minus x to the 7 over 7 evaluated from 0 to 1. This is rho over 2 times 1 minus 1 to the 7th over 7 minus rho over 2. When you plug in 0, you pretty much get 0. Okay? So I got 1 minus 1 seventh, which is, what's 1 minus 1 seventh? 6 sevenths. And half of 6 sevenths is going to be 3 sevenths rho. So the moment about the x is 3 sevenths rho. I come over here to get my y bar, which is the moment about the x divided by the mass. 
Moment about the y, x is equal to 3 sevenths rho divided by the mass, which is 3 fourths rho. When you flip it up, you get y bar to be equal to, well, obviously, when you flip it up, that's a 4 there. You can't read my hand right. All right, when you flip it up, the 3's in them canceling. The answer is just 4 sevenths. Or for those people that just had to give me decimal places, uh, we would also accept 0.57. 1, 4, 2, 8, 5, 7, whatever. So, and so if you plot this out, 0.4 and 0.57 on your graph, 0.4, here's 0.5, 0.4 and 0.57 slightly above that, you're talking about your center of mass being right about there, which kind of matches out. Does that make sense? Again, the reason why we go over this stuff is to remind you of these formulas. That being said, let's take a look at these guys. Can consider the region bounded by the curves. Y equals 0. Y equals X, plus, X squared plus 1. X equals 0. X equals 1. Okay? So, first thing you want to do is you want to graph that. Y equals 0 is also known as the x-axis. X squared plus 1, that's a parabola shifted up one unit. I can handle that, graphing it without a calculator. Y equals X squared plus 1. X equals 0, X equals 0 is the y-axis. Here's the y-axis, also known as X equals 0. And X equals 1, here's 1, it's a vertical line. Here's X equals 1. What region are we talking about that is bounded by all four of these curves? It's this region, <coughs> clearly, in here. Does that make sense? Notice my function is in terms of x. My function is that I find the top is y equals x squared plus 1. Okay? I got y equals 0, x equals 0, x equals 1. Those are my bounds. Question. Set up the setup, but do not evaluate the integral that gives you the volume solved by the region when it's rotated around the x-axis. So we're taking the volume and we want to rotate. about x-axis, okay? What method would you use to rotate around the x-axis? Being my function is in terms of x, I want to rotate around the x-axis. What's the method? Which one? Be confident in your answer. You should know it. Exam is tomorrow. Disc washer. Function in terms of x, rotate around the x-axis, disc washer method. The disc washer method is what? Pi times integral of big radius squared minus little radius squared dx evaluated from a to b. Rotate about the x-axis because my function in terms of x, disk washer method. The big radius, the x-axis is right here. The big radius is from the axis of rotation to the outside edge. So my big radius would be x squared plus 1, officially minus 0. The little radius would be, well, this is the x-axis. So it's zero because this thing's going to end up being solid. So my formula will end up being volume equals pi times integral of x squared plus 1 squared dx because the r squared is zero, r, little r zero. And my bounds are going to be, my x numbers are between zero and one. And this is what we were looking for. Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, the question says, set up, but do not evaluate the integral. This is as far as you go. And if you went farther, uh, trust it, we're not going to give you any extra points. We take away points. We don't give points. Seriously, uh, we're, we're not, you know, it's like, it's like a three-point problem. So you get either zero, one, or two, or three points, or something like that when we grade this thing. This is only part A. So the whole thing's worth ten points. This is how we grade them. So give us what we want, but show your work and how you did it. So, let's say you screwed this problem up. However, on this particular problem, if you wrote down the disk washer formula, you probably get one or two points out of the three-point problem because that was the crux of it, if in case you screwed something up. So always show your work to get that partial credit stuff. Always show your formula. Well, let's take a look at the next problem then. 
Set up, but do not evaluate the problem with about the integral which gives the volume of a solid form when the region is rotated about the line x equal, I'm sorry, y, y equals 2. So it's still my same region right here. I got a parabola, x equals 1, y equals x squared plus 1, x equals 0, which is the y axis, y equals 0, which is the x axis, right here. But this time I'm rotating around the line y equals 2. Y equals 2 is up here. Y equals 2 is parallel to what axis? It is parallel to the X axis. So therefore it acts like the X axis. So if the function is in terms of X and you want to rotate around the X axis or parallel, what method do you always use? Disk washer. When the function's in terms of x and you want to rotate around the y-axis or something parallel to the opposing y-axis, then you're going to use the shell method. Okay? So this one, because the function is parallel to the x-axis here, we are going to use the disk washer again. Volume is going to be the disk washer again, which is equal to pi times integral from a to b of the big radius squared minus the little radius squared dx. But the big radius, remember, big radius is from the axis of rotation to the outside edge of your region as you see this guy being rotated. So this would be big radius. But it is a distance. To calculate a distance, it's always top minus bottom or right minus left. We're going tops and bottoms here. What's on top? This is the line y equals 2. Minus this is on bottom, which is the line y equals 0 because it's the x-axis. I have to find the bottom of my region. So 2 minus 0 is pretty much 2. My little radius, however, is from the x-axis to the inside part of my region as you observe it's being rotated. So you have to visualize this stuff. Okay? Little radius would be the axis of rotation, which is 2, minus, this case, this is defined by the function, which is x squared plus 1. Now you can clean them up if you want to, but you didn't have to. And though, so, because they told you just to write them, but set up and do not evaluate the formula. So this is pi times the integral from, my bounds are still over my region, from 0 to 1, of the big radius, which is 2 squared, minus the little radius, which is 2 minus, parentheses, x squared plus 1, close parentheses, close parentheses, the whole radius, squared dx. And if you wanted to clean this guy up and go, well, this is x squared plus 2x plus 1, then you've got to subtract it. So it's negative x squared minus 2x, uh, 2 minus 1 is plus 1, and you put that in there, per we would give you perfectly full credit for that. If you wanted to clean them up, knock yourself out. But this is all you needed because you had to just show your work. Okay? But now, to answer your question on the other side over here, I haven't forgotten yet, but wait. Set up, but do not evaluate the integral of which is taking this region. And notice, just like we did on the test, just like we did on that uh, calculator project when we did all those region stuff in Chapter 7, one region beat to death. We're rotating it left, rotating it right, rotating it up, rotating it round. We're doing it all over the place, but it's the same region. They love to do this on the final exam as well. That's why I made you guys do it on that calculator project. Same region. Y equals x squared plus 1 from 0 to 1. This is your x-axis, or y equals 0. This is the y-axis, also known as x equals 0. This is my region. But this time, what are we rotating around? We're going to rotate. This one is going to be rotated about the line x equals 1. x equals 1 is a vertical line. A vertical line is parallel to what axis? The y-axis. Therefore, being parallel to the y-axis, and my function is still in terms of x, that never changed, what's the rule? When the function in terms of x, we want to go around and rotate, rotate around x, that is dishwash method. But when the function is in terms of x, and I want to go around, go around the y-axis or parallel, I'm going to use the Shell method. And what is my shell method formula that we have memorized? 
volume is equal to 2 pi times integral from A to B of what I call the point radius times top minus bottom dx. Point radius. Yeah, question. You may not be great in this section of our exam. So yes. Yeah, yeah, I've explained it to them. <laughs> Seriously, most of the people or even the faculty are watching these videos going, hey, that's pretty good, and, and copying what I do. I don't know why they don't give me a bigger raise. I don't want to get a raise in the first place. I just say it. My, my salary is embarrassing. But uh, okay, but no, they, they will know. And I will be there to explain it to them because I have the large section of 150. So when they see those power capacitors, they're just this big compared to all the other classes, which is this big, they go, oh, crap. And so they look at my big pile of papers here. But when they, they will be one of the first ones that they grade and they go through. And they look at this, they know. And then I'm also there going, well, point radius is that distance from the axis of rotation to an internal point inside. And they go, oh, well, that makes sense. OK. So and then after a while, they start mimicking it. So they actually, most of the faculty actually use the point radius concept, too. I know it's not in the book. It's something that, quote unquote, I came up with. But uh, we share stuff. They all know. OK? So. What would my point radius here? So my volume would be 2 pi times integral. The point radius is an arbitrary point inside your region, which I'm calling x right here, to the axis of rotation. Now that is a distance that we're rotating. But we're rotating every individual point that's in this region. But we need a distance. Distance is either top minus bottom or right minus left. So what would the point radius be in this one? Very good. Right minus left. So it is 1 minus x. If I was rotating around the y-axis itself, it would be x minus 0 or just x. That's OK. But if it's either, so my point radius is either going to be x minus a number or a number minus x times the top function. What, what defines the top part of this function? It is x squared plus 1 minus what defines the bottom part of this region? 0. Put a little extra parentheses there. dx. So it's point radius times top region minus bottom region, dx, over my bounds. Where is the region located at? Not where I'm going, but where's the region at? 0 to 1. And this is what they wanted to see. You didn't have to put the minus 0. Fine. That was the actual answer that they wrote down, but there you go. All right. But remember what I told you guys about this final exam and those guys trying to give you questions and make you think. In these, the formulas that I gave you on this problem, before we move on to the last question here, or second last question here. All right, in this problem right here, the formulas that I gave you guys in terms of disk washer and shell method formulas down here, these were all based upon the function being in terms of x. When the functions of x, and I want to go around the x-axis, dishwasher. When the functions in terms of x, I want to go around the y-axis, that's the shell method. What happens if they gave you the function in terms of y on this exam? What are you going to do? Well, if the functions in terms of y, you got y squared plus 1 and y minus 3 or something like that. If you got the function in terms of y, and they want to rotate around the y-axis, what are you going to use? No, think about it. Variable, there's a pattern here. Variable to variable. When the variables are the same, it's dishwasher. When the variables are opposite, it's shell method. So if the function's in terms of y, and I want to go around the y-axis, that's dishwasher. When the function in terms of y, and I want to rotate around the opposing x-axis, that's going to be the shell method. But then you have to change all those dx's to dy's, but it's the same form. Does that make sense? So. Just be careful because they love to do that kind of mess at you guys to get you guys to think outside the box, understanding how to develop mathematics and how to apply it. But there's a pattern for this. When the axis are the same, functions in terms of x rotating around x, that's dishwasher. They're the same. When the functions are in terms of x, I'm rotating around the y-axis, that's shell method because they're opposite variables. And I flip them up, it's the same deal. All right. Well, here we go. We're going to have to pump some crap out of a tank. Here we got a spherical tank with a radius of five meters. It's partially filled with water. Five meters deep in the middle. 
how much work is required to pump all the water out of a, out water out through a hole at the top of the tank. Use the facts that the mass density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube and acceleration due to gravity is uh, 9.8 meters per second square. This is all they gave me. All right. Well, they gave you a little bit more here. They said it was a spherical tank. Okay. So if you think 3D, this thing is actually like sitting out looking like this. So it's a 3D shape here. But when you look at the cross section, which is what you really need with this stuff, what is my cross section? It is a circle. And I mentioned to you guys before, you, it's all about where you put the coordinate axis. So if they gave me a cone or a uh, rectangular pull or a cylindrical pull or some kind of trough or something or other, I always put the axis at the bottom. The only time I'm ever going to put the axis in the middle is when my cross section is a what? Circle, which this is. So this is where I'm going to put my cross sections. So this is a circle of radius 5. So it's 5 up here, negative 5 down here, negative 5 over here, 5 over here, x-axis, y-axis. And my water, it's only half filled with water. So the water is on the bottom part. All right, let's go through my standard forms that I've given you guys. Work is equal to the sum of delta force times the distance you are going to have to pump. Okay? Delta force is equal to what I called water weight times the delta volume slice. So let's start out with the concept of water weight. This thing is in meters. You with me? This thing is measured in meters. So therefore, being in meters, what is my water weight going to be? 9,800. Reason why, and if we remember this, the water weight with the metric system is always the density, which they'll have to give you if it's something other than water. Water, you should know, it's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. But uh, it's density times gravity. You notice they gave you both density and gravity for those folks that didn't know. And you're supposed to multiply density times gravity to get the water weight, which is 9,800. Okay? Times the delta volume. Now remember, this is a sphere. You have to think 3D on this thing. And I'm going to make a little delta Y slice. And if I slice this thing right here and pull it over, what is it going to look like? And remember, when my delta Y little slices only look like one of two things, it's either going to be a disc shape or it's going to be a box shape, depending on the shape of the structure. This is a sphere. If you take a sphere and take your Ginsu knife and slice it right down the middle and take a little wedge out of it, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like a little disc. Where the delta Y tall but what is the radius going to be? Because we need to find the volume of this guy. The volume of a disc is pi r squared h. The height, h, is delta y. What would my radius be equal to? Outstanding. It is x. It is on a slant. It's not solid. It is on a slant. And being on a slant, it depends on where I put my delta y slice what that disc is going to be. It may be a little bit, maybe equal a lot, maybe up to five. It's somewhere between zero and five. That's what the radius is going to be, but he varies. And I'm moving away from the y-axis. So my radius, when I move away from the y-axis, is in the x direction. So the radius is equal to x, so my delta volume would be pi x squared times delta y. Because it's a disc. So delta volume is equal to pi x squared delta y. Okay? So work, which is equal to the sum, the delta force, we just got to be 9800 pi x squared delta y. Now, we've got to figure out that distance that we need to pump it. Based upon where I put the coordinate axis, this is all about put coordinate axis, I put my coordinate axis right down the middle. But I made my slice right here in an arbitrary Y level on that Y axis. Remember, work is all about lift. We're lifting this stuff up. I'm taking this level right here, and I'm lifting it all the way up, and they said lift it to the, at the hole at the top of the tank. 
So I'm lifting it to the top of the tank. So where's my target? Where am I trying to get all this water to? I, this is my target right up here. Relative to where I put my axis, my target is up here at 5. So it is a distance. Remember, distance are either top minus bottom or right minus left. This is a lifting distance, so it's always top minus bottom. So what is the distance I have to lift this thing? 5 minus y. 5, the target, minus my arbitrary slice variable, where I ever put it. Does that make sense? And does that ring a bell? Because I know you did 10,000 of these problems earlier. Okay? By the way, I'll let you guys know, on this section of my test, you guys actually did score the highest grade, which was in the low, mid, low to mid-80s of any test I've ever given on that particular section. So hopefully this all comes back, because obviously you knew it at one time. So here we go. Now, here we go. Well, you deserve a little bit of a compliment after that uh, scathing results on chapter test four that you guys just did. All right, so here we go. Convert it to calculus. Work is equal to 9,800 pi. Summation turns into what? Integral of x squared times 5 minus y. And what does the delta y from turning from summation to integration turn into? What does the delta y turn into? dy. Welcome to capital. Summation turns into integral. Delta y turns into dy. So I am trying to integrate this thing. Uh, it's the 180 pi times integral of x squared times 5 minus y delta dy. Delta y turns into dy. I got a problem. What's my problem? I got an x in the middle of my integrating respect to y's. So I got to come up with a relationship between x and y. What defines the relationship between x and y? That's why your cross-sectional cut is the relationship of the edge of the tank. What is the edge of the tank in this example? It's a circle. Usually it's either going to be a line. I guess they could throw a parabola. They did that one semester to you guys. But it's either going to be a line, a parabola, or in this case, the classic one is a circle. And you've got to remember all these formulas, but this is from um, college algebra. What is the equation of a circle? The equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Centered at the origin. That's why I put my guy at the origin. You could also, if you want to center it someplace else, use the equation x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. You can use the general form if you want to. But I always center the circles in an origin. makes my equation a little easier. What was the radius of this particular circle here? What was it? It's going to be 5. So x squared plus y squared would be equal to 5 squared, which is 25. I want to solve for x squared. What would x squared be equal to if I have the equation of that circle, which is that outside of that tank, is equal to x squared plus y squared equals 25? That would be 25 minus y squared. There is the equation for the edge of my tank. Does that make sense? And I'm going to go down here and replace it. Work would be equal to 9800 pi times integral. The reason why I didn't solve for just x, I solved for x squared because x squared is actually in the fun function here that I'm trying to integrate, which is uh, 25 minus y squared times y minus 5 dy. Now the last thing and the most important thing is this. What would your bounds be? Where the water is relative to the numbers on your tank. Not where it's going. You're not going to integrate from negative 5 to 5 because that's, the water is not all there. Where is the water located at before you pumped? It's from negative 5 to 0. That's my bounds because that's where the water is located at. If this tank was full of water, then I would integrate from negative 5 to 5. Okay? And just to throw a question at you, let's say we want to pump only half the water out of this tank. When you're pumping water out of a tank, do you remove the top half or the bottom half and go slurp on your slurpee and figure it out as it's sitting on a cup here? When you start taking stuff out of the cup, does the top half seem to remove or the bottom half is removed? It's the top half. So if I try to take out half the water, I would integrate from what? Negative 2.5 to 0 or something like that because the top half is removed. Yeah. 
Yes, there's only two possibilities when you make slices. When I do that horizontal slice, it's either going to be a disc shape or it's going to be a rectangular box shape, which is length times width times height, which is, you know, which is like uh, 2x times whatever the long distance is, which is given in a function, and times delta y. Yeah, so it's either length times width times height or pi r squared h. There's only two ways you can make slices. All right? Now, the last thing, because they said, hey, this is what they were looking for in terms of work, but here's the deal. They just asked how much work. You were supposed to give them the grandiose big answer altogether, and because this is so bad, you could fold this out, but on this kind of a problem, they're actually expecting you guys to use a calculator on it. Okay? So let's do it. I would leave the 900 off and just take 98, and I'm sorry, leave the pi off, and take the 9800, that's an 8 there in case you can't read that, 9800, leave the pi off, math number 9, integrate. My function is, another parentheses, 25 minus x squared, close parentheses, times 5 minus x, I'm changing y's to x's for the calculator purpose here, close parentheses, comma, variable, comma, low bound, which is negative 5, comma, to 0, because that's where the water's at. Okay? And so when I integrate it, I got that. We would accept the answer 56145388.3333. Don't forget your pi, putting it back on the answer. And for those people that just have to know what the number is, we'll take that number and multiply it times pi. We would also accept that the answer work is equal to 176387.33.75, which is 17,638,733.75, but you lost points if you didn't tell me the units. What was it? Newton meters or joules? Does that make sense? And again, joules, um, we would have also accepted the classic Newton meters in case you wanted to know. That would have given you full credit. 10 points, there it is, right on the exam, and all we were looking for is this right here, see if you guys got the answer, and we would accept either one of those two answers, okay? Well, keep going, what do we got next? Oh yeah, cool. Just like the one, very similar, except I made an easier problem, that we gave you guys on your last test. Let's take a look. All right, so, it says this here, the McLaurin series, let me blow it up so you guys can see it in the back a little bit. There we go. The, power, the McLaurin power series expansion for the cosine of x is this. Cosine of x equals 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, yada, yada, yada. Write down the first five non-zero terms for the McLaurin series for the cosine of 2x. If you learn anything about the power series, is that this. They're easy to manipulate. So they gave me the power series for the cosine of x, the McLaurin series for the cosine of x. They want me to write down the, the McLaurin series for the cosine of t squared. I don't have to actually write down the derivative function, derivative, plug in zeros and stuff like that to it. You actually are supposed to use this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to replace all the x's with what? That's all you have to do. 1 minus t squared squared over 2 factorial plus t squared to the 4th uh, over 4 factorial minus t t to the 6, I'm sorry, t squared to the 6 over 6 factorial plus t squared to the 8 over 8 factorial, yada, yada, yada. And all I'm supposed to do is write down the first five. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm happy at this point. And they did say five, so I had to write down all these guys. But you should always clean it up. Power to a power, what do you do with the powers? Oh, no, power to a power, what do you do with the powers? X squared squared, X squared to the fourth. Power to a power, you multiply powers. So the cosine of T squared would have been one minus t to the 4th over 2 factorial plus t to the 8th over 4 factorial minus t to the 12th over 6 factorial plus t to the 16th over 8 factorial. 
plus dot, 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 of course. And of course, you understand what people just did. They just completely killed this problem. And here's the first three points. And because power to power, they would have added or something weird like that. They have just completely killed this problem. And they just would have gotten wrong, wrong, wrong. Because this is one of those, if you screw up part A, you're dead on part B. You will never get part C. And you might as well take this class all over again. Understand, don't screw this up. It's very simple. That's why they're doing the part A, part B, part T, simple. Question? <coughs> Not always. So this is one that you should have had memorized. Which ones are we supposed to have memorized? Natural log of X, the cosine, the sine, the 1 over 1 minus X, and the tangent inverse of X. Remember those guys? Those are your, those are your guys you're supposed to have memorized. But that was nice. Sometimes they give them to you, sometimes they don't. That's why have them memorized, just in case they don't. Because I have no idea. I have not seen the exam for tomorrow. I and all the other Calc 2 professors aren't allowed to see the exam. The committee is made up of people who aren't teaching Calc 2 at this present moment in time this semester. They get together and muddle over the old exams and they try to come up with a new one to burn you guys on. So let's see how they did tomorrow. Basically, this is how the game is played. So maybe ne well, next semester I'm still teaching Calc 2, but the following semester I won't be teaching Calc 2 or something or other. Then, no doubt, I'll be chunked on this committee and I'll have to make up one of these exams and stuff like that. So you get the idea. It's made up of people, so it would try to be fair. Because we, we don't consider it fair if I'm teaching 150 students and I'm making up the exam. Well, my students should do real well on my personal exam, but maybe somebody else's students won't do well, that well on my exam because they haven't had my temperament and my mentality all through that semester. So what's going on is this. A committee is making up this exam to try to uh, give you so no, there's no biasness to the exam. We're, we're beautiful statisticians in the math department. But that also being said, I've tried all semester long to word my exams the way they've tried to word the exams in the past. So you guys should be doing very well on this exam as long as you know your stuff. All right, take a look at the next one. Part B, use part A, <laughs> what a surprise. You died on part A, well, it doesn't matter what you do on part B. To find the first five terms of the Maclaurin series for this guy. So f of x is equal to the integral from zero to x of, well, there it is right there, cosine of t squared, so this is one minus two to the fourth over two factorial plus t to the eighth over four factorial minus t to the twelfth over six factorial plus t to the 16th over 8 factorial, yada, 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 dx. So f of x would be equal to 1 minus, what's the integral of t to the 4th? That's t to the 5th over 5 times that 2 factorial on the bottom, plus, what's the integral of t to the 8th? t to the 9th over 9 times the 4 factorial on the bottom, Minus, what's the integral of t to the 12th? t to the 13th over 13th times 6 factorial. Plus, what's the integral of t to the 16th is t to the 17 over 17 times that 8 factorial. Plus da da da. Evaluated from 0 to x. Because they put bounds on this thing. Yes? I'm sorry, what was that now? Oh, oh, you're jumping the gun now. I integrated them first, and now I got bounds. Fundamental theorem of calculus. Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah, you, you were right. I'm jumping. I'm actually thinking about supper. Sorry. All right, so uh, the integral one is actually T. You're right. All right. Yeah? Why wouldn't you write, uh, like, T to the fifth over five over two factorial? You can. But why don't you clean it up? Because look at what i got to do in part C. I might as well make this problem real nice for me because I'm going to have to crunch some numbers in a minute. I might as well make the numbers nice. So when I integrate, I integrate the variable constants stay where they're at. If they're on the bottom, they're going to stay on the bottom. Constants stay where they're at. You're integrating variables. Okay, But you're right. Thank you for noticing that. The integral of 1 with respect to t is actually t. Now I would have figured it out when I did this. I'm integrating it from 0 to x. What am I supposed to do? Plug in top minus plug in bottom. So therefore, when I plug it in, What's my answer going to look like? It's going to have x's in it. So f of x would be equal to, plug in x, I get x minus x to the fifth over 5 times 2 factorial 
plus x to the ninth over 9 times 4 factorial, minus x to the 13th over 13 times 6 factorial, plus x to the 17th over 17 times 8 factorial, minus, when you plug in 0 for all the t's, what you going to get? What zero added and subtracted up? Zero. So that goes away, and that is managed. And you can always put that plus dot, dot, dot. But they wanted five terms, so make sure you give it to them, otherwise you'll lose a beaner point. One, two, three, four, five. And if you happen to give them six or seven terms, no worries, we don't take off for that. But if they said, you know, give them five, you're going to be using those five terms. You have at least five. You can always do more, don't never do less. Okay? Now the last one, part C. Use part B with the first three non-zero terms. One, two, three. So only these guys here to estimate this. Well, we just integrated it. Now I'm going to integrate between zero and one of the cosine of t squared dt. But I've got to show my work. And I'm going to explain why in just a second. This is going to be equal to, well, this right here is the integral. But instead of 1, I got an x. So what I'm going to do here is basically I'm going to shovel 1 is equal to x in this problem. So this would have been 1 minus 1 to the 5th over 5 times 2 factorial plus 1 to the 9th over 9 times 4 factorial. And they said just the first three terms. Because remember, this function that we just came up with is the integral from 0 to x of cosine of t squared. They want me to integrate basically the integral from 0 to 1 of the cosine of uh, t squared, which is basically just f of 1. I'm just plugging 1's into all my x's. Now, let's clean it up. This will be 1 minus 1 to the fifth is 1. 2 factorial. What's 2, what's two times 1? 2 times 5 is 10 plus 1 to the ninth is 1. What's 4 factorial? That's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. What's that? 4 times 3 is 12 times 2, which is 24 times 1 is 24. And 24 times 9 is 216. The first three non-zero terms. And so this would be equal to 1 minus 1 tenth plus 1 divided by 216. And I get 0.9 zero four six two nine six two nine six and for those people who just love math fractions or they happen to have a t89 and can't figure out where the approximate buttons located at that's 977 over 1080 we would have accepted either one of those answers but last thing I want to do is this and this is why you had to show your work because we had a ton Ton. Remember, there's 2,000 plus folks taking this exam. A ton would be like 1,000 plus here. All right, did this. Oh, this is not a problem. Math number nine, cosine of uh, t squared would be x squared, comma x, comma zero, comma one, boom. And they copied that answer right there. Now let's compare it. Compare that answer to the answer that I got. 0.094, instead of 6, they had a 5, 2, 4. So the decimal is a little bit off, but we only use three terms here. So one, we could recognize an answer. Number two, no work, just the answer showed up in the blank. How many points out of the three or four points this thing was worth did you guys get, guys get credit for? Right, minus 15 points for doing crap that I want to look at. Yeah. What step was that? Uh, right at the beginning of part C. Part C. All right, you understand where this came from. Look at part B. So look at the comparison between the two. So let me blow it up so you guys can see it here. Look at part B. We found the function by integrating this guy for the integral from 0 to x to the cosine of t squared. This is the function that is the integral of the cosine of t squared dt from 0 to x. The question, though, is... What's the integral from 0 to 1 of the cosine of t squared dt? So the comparison between the two is this. This and this is between 0 and x, and this is between 0 and 1. 
Okay? So x had to be 1. So all I did was take this answer right here, and all I had to do was plug 1 into it, and then they only asked me to use the first three non-zero terms. So I used this guy, this guy, and this guy to plug in 1 into it. That was the connection between the two. That's what they're trying to get you guys to look at and see. Yes? Yeah, so how, how many partitions you should need. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that one in just a second. So that's on the test. So let me finish up this one first. So, all right. So, I got a question for you guys. Now that I've done this entire final exam for you guys, how, how would you have done on this final exam? Well, how do you think the folks from last semester did on this particular exam? No, not a 25. They did a little better than that. 65. Uh, 64, actually. The, the average on this exam from last semester was a 64. Why? One, careless errors. Two, I, I think it's also the nature of final exams. You know, it's easy for me to sit up here and do these things because this is what I do all day long. But at the end of the day, it's you have to sit up here and do this exam and be able to make sure that you know how to do it. Okay? So, that being said, all right, now you have to study. Don't let this be the only exam because you know there's a lot more formulas that we've covered throughout this semester that was not on this particular exam. So what you need to do is look back at those other final exams. And I put three of them up there or two more on, on, on your Moodle site. There's also some on the math website you can go back and practice on. But the more the practice, the better. Don't let this be the only uh, exam that you guys look at and start studying because there's a lot more out there, different kinds of shapes of tanks I could pump out, more problems of, of uh, volume rotation, different types of problems like that, center of mass, uh, more work problem. You notice they didn't put any spring problems on this thing. You know there's going to be a spring problem on the exam tomorrow. You know, force equals kx. You got to integral kx, and you got to zero out the natural length and do all that spring stuff. Practice. There's a lot more on this exam than just what I covered. But what we have to do is we got to make an exam that's three hours. So sometimes each semester something gets left out. But look at the semester before. It was probably on that one. Question, yeah. Yeah, but that's not always the case. It depends on who makes up the exam. I've had a lot of them where they emphasize area and volume. I've had a lot of them where they want to do the physics style problems where they got the baby Jessica stuck in the bottom of a well kind of a problem and you got to lift her out. There's always those spring problems they like to throw at you guys. Uh, there, there's so many options that they have. You don't bank on that. But they love work problems, so you can guarantee one or two, at least, are going to come from Chapter 7 on the, on, out of the free response because that was the big word problem section. But there's going to be one of each different type, some basic integral, practice application, remont some stuff. There's also, notice that sequence and series stuff. You're going to see that on that, on that free response part, too. It's a, it's a cumulative final exam. You're going to see a little bit of everything. But the word problem thing is really pushed hard in terms of this section. You'll probably see at least two of them from Chapter 7. Okay? So, well, like I said, don't let this be the only exam you guys study, and I'm going to pause this thing out for just a second here. So...